You're in the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. Hi, neighbors. First, I want to remind you that the Paracast is brought to you this week by Audible.com, the Internet's leading provider of audiobooks with more than 85,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature, including fiction, nonfiction, and periodicals. For a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash Paracast. This week on the Paracast, we present Jerome Clark, UFO researcher, historian, has been around for a number of years and has always fascinating insights, and later on he'll be answering your questions. I wanted to get into the show right away because of some of the things that have happened this week, and I wondered if, Jerry, you've ever considered the issues about life and death and whether people who are about to die kind of get the sense even if they're not ill, that's almost coming to an end. Have you ever heard that in your experience? Well, I think we all have. You know, I have no special authority on that subject, but yes, you know, I I'm not that either. Happens. But, you know, premonition action. Yeah, I think about this. For example, before my father died in 1988 on September 9th, that was my birthday, and he calls me the night before and he says, "You know, are you doing okay and everything?" And he spent more time to reassure himself that I was all right. And then he never spent that much time on the phone with me, and the next day he died. Now, as far as I knew, he wasn't ill. He just was playing cards with his friends, and he was suddenly seized with a heart attack, and he was out. But it's as if he knew the day before that the end was near, and he just wanted to make peace and make sure everybody in his family was okay. Wow. Yeah, that happens. I remember one time getting a call from somebody who was just called to talk. I was sort of surprised that he called me. We chatted for some time, and I said, well, I'll talk to you again. And I never did because he died soon thereafter. And, and, and thinking about it later, I realized that he knew he was dying. He was calling me just one last time. And, um, yeah, those things happen. Here's one for you. I, you know, Believe it or not, I was reconnected with my uh, biological family after 41 years, and I'd been adopted with my three younger siblings. Brother Brennan and I grew up in, in the same adopted family, and then my youngest two brothers grew up in the same adopted family. And in 2001, we were reunited. I had a wonderful two years of getting to know my mom. <laughs> it was quite a stunning phone call when they found me uh, via the Internet and the family reunion site that I'd registered on. They'd been looking for me for decades, and, and my wow. brothers. Yeah, <laughs> my girlfriend answered the phone, and her eyes got real wide, and she covered the phone up. She said, there's some lady on the phone. Her name is Eva, and she says she's your mommy. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God. Sure enough, uh, I reconnected within a week and a half. Uh, my mom and my cousin had flown out, and we'd reconnected. And, and it was great. I, I finally you know, got a chance to sort of reconcile her life for her. And we had a big family reunion, uh, the four brothers and her at my brother's house in Washington State. We spent a wonderful five days together you know, just before Christmas. Right after we left, she went into the hospital. She uh, had very bad asthma and emphysema. And I call her up on Christmas Day. I had a little party over at my house when I was out back east for a couple of years. And, and I called her up, and I wished her, you know, happy Merry Christmas and all that. And then I got a call back from her, uh, I don't know, probably about an hour or so later. And had this wonderful, heartfelt, you know, short little conversation with her and how her life had been complete. And she was so happy her boys were doing good. And then... Three or four minutes later, I got a call from the hospital saying, your mother hung up the phone, evidently, and died. So I, I literally, within seconds, <laughs> wow. very, very strange. And of course, you know, she dies on Christmas Day. You know, it kind of reminded me of Gene saying that his father died on his birthday. It's kind of like hard, it's hard to forget that day. But, uh, yeah, these things do happen. It's human consciousness, I think, as I th- I'm sure both y- y- you uh, will agree, is uh, quite a, an amazing mystery. We really don't know that much. Science really doesn't know how we can look at our hand and then, and then create an impulse to close it, let's say, or take a step. It's a very interesting subject. Not enough work, I think, is being done really trying to get to the bottom of the enigma of human consciousness. And then, of course, the tie-in between consciousness and the paranormal and, and UFOs and you know, these wonderful mysteries that the Paracast covers all the time. I figured I'd, I'd, <laughs> I, I didn't want to, like, play it. I, I could top that, but we, I literally talked to my mother just uh, seconds before she uh, hung up the phone and died. So. That's an incredible experience. 
Well, yeah. you know, the reason I raise is because this week, of course, Steve Jobs, an icon in American industry compared to a Thomas Edison or Walt Disney, probably more closer to a Walt Disney died. And it's interesting when he died because we know he had been ill. He had pancreatic cancer in 2004. He had a liver transplant in 2009, taken an extended sick leave. And then, of course, he must have known the end was near because just last month he stepped down as the CEO of Apple. And Tim Cook, who had been the operations officer and temporary CEO, replaced him. But now we have this week, Apple introduces their new iPhone. And Tim Cook, (laughs) with the kind of with Siri, which is a personal digital assistant, like putting Hal in your cell phone. Now, what's interesting here is that Jobs was not in attendance, obviously. Tim Cook ran the show, just like Steve Jobs would have done a few months earlier. And then the next day, Jobs died almost as if to say, well, I see the company is in good hands. I don't have to hold on any longer. Goodbye. Well, maybe maybe they somehow figured out a way to get his consciousness into some big mainframe or something. <laughs> you think it's in my iPhone? Let me look. Steve, are you in there? Earth to Steve. Engage. No. Got to try out that personal digital assistant. That's why the reason I brought that over. And also, I think it's time, you know, we like to try to talk and get to know the people who come on the Paracast and all the things they have to say that extend beyond the normal range of our discussions. And certainly we'll go back right now pretty much to the areas where Jerry Clark has covered for so many years UFOs. And, of course, he's been on the show several times. And I wanted to get into maybe the changes in the UFO field. I mean, over the years we've had the fakes, the frauds, the phonies, the tabloid journalism. So, Jerry, when you heard, for example, this thing over Phil Imbrogno, that his credentials were fake, all that stuff. Did you know him? No. I, my communication with Phil Brogno, in Brogno over the years was somewhere between non-existent and extremely slight. In fact, I don't even remember a contact with him. And uh, I was sorry to hear that. I'm always sorry when you hear things like that, and they happen not just in ufology, obviously, but in all areas of uh, human experience. And uh, you just feel sad that someone felt that he couldn't make it on his own and he had to invent credentials that he didn't really need. And in the end, all of us are judged by our accomplishments, you know, not anything else. And um, it's just sort of sad. Just because, you know, the naysayers, more ammunition. To, well, they, know, they always have something. I mean, no matter what happens, you know, we're not going to win with them. They're just, you know, out to discredit us and, to, and destroy the whole enterprise. So I don't worry right. about that. I just think of it more in human terms. And I thought this guy probably, Phil Inbrook, was probably not a bad guy. He just did something incredibly dumb for reasons only known to himself. Right. Well, I mean, obviously we don't want to get into the more sordid aspects of that because I've heard other stories and I don't want to get into it. But the point being, of course, that he casts disrespect on everyone in the field when he does stuff like that. And that's well, what me. Me. I, 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 that, I think that's probably reading too much into it. I think that it's just one of those things. You know, it, it, it's not just ufology in which this sort of thing happens. People's inflated credentials are all over the landscape. I mean, it's actually a, you know, sort of a, a national, international problem. But what, one thing I don't understand is why people do it, because it's so easy to find out if they're lying or not these days. And um, uh, it's just, yeah. You know, in fact, when you mentioned it, I just hadn't even thought about it. I'd completely forgotten about it. I don't think it, it's really a big issue. Yeah. Well, it, obviously, it boils down to deep-seated insecurity and worthiness issues on the part of these people exactly. Really exactly. to do that. And it's unfortunate because, you know, I, I, I always had a sense that, that there was something kind of amiss with uh, the presentation of some of his material, but I but I did look up to him because I did feel that he was the kind of person that was getting out in the field and attempting to do good good field research. But now, because of that very <laughs> unfortunate tawdry affair, now you have to call into question every single thing that he published. And, and yes, and you do. We have Jerome Clark joining us with Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. <laughs> Uh, 
As you know, the Paracast is brought to you by Audible.com, the Internet's leading provider of audiobooks with more than 85,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature, featuring audio versions of many New York Times bestsellers. For our listeners, Audible is offering a free audiobook to give you a chance to try out their service, such as Leslie Kane's UFOs, Generals, Pilots, and Government Officials Go on the Record. For that free audiobook, go to audiblepodcast.com slash paracast. That's audiblepodcast.com slash paracast. Neighbors, do you need to bring the final touches to your latest podcasts? Clean up the soundtrack of that holiday video. Mix together a few takes from your last jamming session. Process the audio files of the video game you're creating to sound just right. But look no further. Whatever audio-related task you're looking to perform, Amadeus Pro is the tool for you. It's the Swiss Army knife of sound editing. Go to Herrersoft.com. H A I R E R Soft.com. Hello again. I hope all is well. This is John Swenson at Midas Resources, 800 686 2237, extension 128. We are your source for gold and silver. Not much has changed since we last spoke. The economy remains in the tank. Unemployment is a national disaster, and there's zero leadership in Washington. Experts tell us that the stock market is headed towards 7,000. The deficit will continue to climb. Still, gold is expected to go to 2000 by the first quarter. That had put silver back nearing 50 bucks. Frankly, Scarlett, there are no solid options available beyond precious metals. Please give me a call, John Swenson, 800-686-2237, extension 128, for an informative, no-pressure conversation. John Swenson, 800-686-2237, extension 128, and I look forward to hearing from you. Still ready to save? Then you're ready for the fall super sale at HerbalHealer.com. HerbalHealer.com has been the leader in quality natural supplements since 1988. Log on to HerbalHealer.com and take advantage of incredible fall savings on all sale products running through October 18th. HerbalHealer.com is proud to offer eFoods Global Products, premium storable foods that are delicious, contain no MSG, no trans fats, no GMO, and have a 25-year shelf life. All you do is just add water. To learn more, click the eFoods link on HerbalHealer.com and you can try eFood storable meals for free. And don't forget to click the specials link for even more savings at HerbalHealer.com. Be sure to sign up for our free newsletter. And as always, new customers get a free 128-page catalog with your order. HerbalHealer.com, healing the world with nature one person at a time. Hurry, sale ends October 18th. You can't argue with success, and many people have found great success in fighting back colds and flu viruses with Ali C, the world's best garlic extract. So now, it's time to get even more success with the other great quality natural products from Affinity Health Products, like C Energy Liquid Vitamins, Lose and Snooze, and the One Day Diet, or Human Growth Hormone Support menopause specialist for women and joint specialist see these and many other quality affinity health products for men and women online at affinityhealthproducts.com that's a-f-f-i-n-i-t-y healthproducts.com or call in your orders at 877-888-7126 that's 1-877-888-7126 trust your health to the makers of alley c the world's best garlic extract Affinity Health Products, the finest and most innovative natural health products available. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And if you'd like to catch up on past episodes, we have hundreds of shows for you to download. Direct from theparacast.com. That's theparacast.com. Or check us out at iTunes. We have Jerome Clark, author of UFO Encyclopedia, other works, millions of articles and stuff like that, covering the UFO scene for many, many years. And we're discussing UFO researchers who sort of discredit themselves because they lie about their credentials, their experience, their background, things like that. And you were about to say something else in response to Chris's remarks. Jerry, go ahead, please. Yeah, you know, 
I think that it's probably true that Ebrono has really done some very good work, some good investigation and research work. But as as Chris said, you know, even even the good that he's done is lost by, you know, a bonehead decision to inflate your credentials. There's just no way you're gonna win on that one. No. Well ain't that the truth. I remember that he wrote a book with Alan Hynek. In fact I think it was the last book with Alan's name on the cover. Night Siege. Yeah, Night yeah, Siege. Yeah. That was the first book I read by him. Yeah. I didn't Got really it. know even that he was off on other areas, you know, in, in the into the paranormal and so on. I I just really hadn't paid a lot of attention to him, to tell you the truth. You know, when you've been around as long as I have, you tend to focus on your own research projects. And the people you keep in touch with are, you know, old colleagues that you can trust and you know them and and you know how they think and and you can exchange information and and find, you know, the information trustworthy. People that you don't know kind of sort of fade off into the side because they're just not engaged in what, you know, what interests you or what you're doing. Well, over the years in UFO research, have you met any reasonable number of people who play that game, lied about their credentials? Oh, I'm sure there have been some. Yeah, they just don't come to mind. It just hasn't really, you know, affected my life and and my focus. And the people that I know and trust don't do that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, I think that Stan Friedman is a guy who's played it right that way. He you know, has genuine educational and professional credentials that precede his life in ufology, and he's never lied about them. And I think no, that's, in fact, he's, that he's very, very Stan, quick to correct people when they when they call him doctor. He says, "I'm no doctor. Exactly. I don't have a PhD." Yeah. Stan understands that that um, you know you have to play that straight because your critics and your opponents are going to try to discredit you if you're lying about anything. Right. So you always have to tell the truth. It's sort of like what uh, you know Mark Twain famously said that that he he didn't lie because it, it forced him to remember too many things. <laughs> and yeah. uh, it's just easier to be honest. It's just, you know, if you're out there and you're and you're making controversial claims as anybody in ufology is by definition, you know, you better have your life in order because otherwise there are people going to go rummaging through it to hurt you. Okay. And I've never made a secret of the fact that I'm I'm a college dropout. You know, I don't have any degrees. And um, no well, so would Bill people. Gates and Steve Jobs were both college dropouts. It didn't hurt them any. <laughs> yeah, there are a few of us out there managed to do yeah. something nonetheless. So it's possible to survive that way. And you hire college graduates to do the heavy lifting. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, I underpay them but keep them happy. Exactly. That's how you do it. You know, you have a few billion dollars, you know, and you, you hire those college graduates and there you go. Now, yeah, but look at what's going on in, in society right now. I mean, how many kids are graduating, you know, with 20 years of debt facing them in the face, and they can't get, get a job at Burger King with a, with a degree? Uh, it's, it's really sad. Yeah. I, I, my, my daughter has a degree in philosophy from the University of uh, Wisconsin. In, in fact, an advanced degree in philosophy. And uh, she's worked in retail clothing for years, and it's glad to have a job. Exactly. <laughs> My roommate from college is, was a philosophy major. He couldn't get a, a job in, in his, you know, his field of passion and expertise uh, to save his life. He had to go back and, and get re-educated and, and become a, uh, you know, a counselor, so actually uh, helping people substance abuse counselors. So, yeah. yeah so. Well, I was an English major in college, and that did help me learn how to write. And it did give me an appreciation for reading and literature and all those things, which actually served my well, served me well even in my little career in ufology and Fordism. Right. So let's just look at that more in UFO field about people's reactions. Now, you're trying to look good, I guess, obviously, in the UFO field for skeptics. You want to say, look, we're responsible people. We're trying to present evidence about something that we don't understand. At the same time, I don't, care. I don't care about skeptics. Actually, that they have their minds made up that nothing that you're going to do is going to change their ideology and and, and their task to discredit the, the field, the people who are in it, 
the whole idea of extraordinary phenomena out there. I don't care about them. Uh, to the extent that I care about them, I care that I don't give them something that they can use to discredit me. But beyond that, I'm addressing serious colleagues and intelligent, open-minded people outside our little world. And I think that I have succeeded in doing that just from my life experience, that the people I intend to address are receptive to what I'm saying. And they consider me trustworthy. And that's really what I want to do. But dealing with skeptics, you know, you know, I'll be 65 years old next month, and I just don't have time for that crap anymore. At this point, you're too old to put up with that nonsense. I spent a lot of time battling with the bunkers, you know, with Phil Class and, and you know, his ilk. And it's just a waste of time. Speaking of the debunkers, do we have anybody today of the caliber of Phil Class to contend with? No. No, I'm, I'm not talking about Bill Nye, the silence guy. No, no. The, the, these guys are just, you know, kind of bubblegum types. Um, no, right. class was really, so to speak, in a class of his own. This was a guy who really knew the subject. And he really did, you know, do research and investigation. I mean, it was hardly objective. But it was genuine, genuine inquiry. He was trying to find answers that suited him. And when you dealt with Phil Glass, you were dealing with somebody who knew what he was talking about. And he would look for, you know, mistakes and errors and investigation. And in that sense, he was he was good for people because it forced them to, you know, clean up their act and, and play their best game. And I didn't particularly like Glass. I knew him for many years. He and I had a voluminous correspondence. I don't think that he was a good guy. But I actually think that I had a certain grudging respect for for his knowledge and um, his energy. And I think that, as I say, he forced us to be our best because we right. weren't. He was going to get us. He was sure a pit bull. Thank, yes, thank he was. I mean, you he never, was. never knew who I was. I walked up at the 98 MUFON uh, Symposium in Denver and he was kind of trudging down the hallway and with his walker, and I put my arm around him and said, how are you doing, you old bulldog? And he looked at me like, do I know you? And I said, no, and that's a good thing. <laughs> it's a good thing that we're talking to Jerome Clark this week with Gene and Chris. You're in. The Paracast. <laughs> America's number one source for independent talk radio for over a decade. We are the GCN Radio Network. So here's what happened. I was placing an order online. The site went down. It just stopped responding. It took hours before it returned, but I had already placed the order with another company. If your site goes down, you could lose business. And if you have a business or personal site, you want to know it's easy to run and it will stay online. At iWeb, your site is hosted on one of the most reliable networks in the world. Check it out. iWeb.com. That's iWeb.com. For 58 years, fate has provided true reports of the strange and unknown. Fate brings you the latest in all aspects of the paranormal, like angels and miracles, psychic phenomena, ghosts, UFOs, and much, much more. To receive your complimentary fate magazine, call now at 1-800-728-2730 or visit their website at www.fatemag.com. That's 1-800-728-2730. What are you waiting for? Your fate awaits. Before you throw away your used batteries, you need to listen to this. Now, going green can save money. Go green and save money by giving life to your used batteries by charging them with the Renaissance Charger. The Renaissance Charger uses a new revolutionary battery charging technology that effectively extends the life of new batteries and gives new life to used batteries. Invented by legendary audio genius John Bedini, this unique and patented charging system rejuvenates the electrochemical plate structure in the battery without additives, increasing capacity and maintaining cell integrity. Renaissance Charge offers a full line of products made in the USA for all types and sizes of batteries. Find out why our customers tell us the Renaissance Charger is the only battery charger they will ever use. Save your money. Save the environment. Visit us online at r-charge.com. That's r-charge.com. Or call us at 208-772-4514. That's 208-772-4514. Be a part of the revolution today. 
OpticsPlanet.com is where discerning gun owners and outdoorsmen go to gear up. Optics Planet has the best selection of rifle scopes, red dots, night vision, holsters, bags, and tactical gear on the planet. With always low prices, free shipping on most orders, and expert customer service. Go to OpticsPlanet.com slash GCN to get a free gift with purchase. That's OpticsPlanet.com slash GCN. Or call 800-332-OPTICS. 800-332-6784. That's the sound of your door being kicked in by an intruder with a single kick. That's the sound of the same door now protected by the Door Sentinel at MySafeDoor.com. Go to MySafeDoor.com right now and watch the amazing video. At MySafeDoor.com, you'll learn how to turn your home into a fortress with the Door Sentinel. 16 kicks later, and the Door Sentinel is still holding strong. MySafeDoor.com. That's MySafeDoor.com. Keeping food on hand for emergencies protects you the same way as does insurance on your home or car. With Freeze Dry Guy Freeze Dried Foods in your food reserve, you can be ready for just about any unexpected crisis. Right now, for the month of October 2011, Freeze Dry Guy is letting their customers get first dibs on the meat bucket special. That's roasted chicken, Southwest style chicken, teriyaki style chicken, stroganoff style beef, cheesy ground beef, and savory roasted ground beef. Just add hot water and enjoy. Portable, easy, convenient. Real meat, real good. Supplies won't last with this special offer. Order today to beef up your freeze-dried meat supply. You'll even get $20 back in survival bucks or loyalty dollars when you beat the rush and order our freeze-dried meat buckets. Go to freezedryguy.com. That's freezedryguy.com. Or call 866-404-3663. That's 866-404-FOOD. Hi, this is Don Ecker, and you are tuned in to the Paracast. Let me tell you what, you're going to hear stuff here that you probably won't hear anywhere else. Hear that, George Snorri? Jerome Clark is our guest. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast as we continue. We started talking about our perceptions of life and death and then UFOs about those who have discredited the field by dint of the fact that they mislead us on their credentials, about the skeptics and about we don't have the informed skeptics anymore, we have the dismissive ones. What about these controversies that show up occasionally? And I think of the tabloid journalism around the attacks of two well-known abduction researchers, one of whom is no longer with us. What are your feelings when things like that happen? Well, let me put it this way. I have a couple of ex-wives walking the world. Don't we all? Yes, and I'm just glad that they go on with their lives as I go on with mine. We don't bother each other. Yeah. And I think that that's what this is about, and it's really unfortunate. And it was unfortunate that Bud Hopkins, who was a seriously ill man, had to endure that for the last year or two of his life. Yeah, that was a bad long time. My friend of mine was a good guy. Well, the thing is also, which is so unfortunate, is sane people can disagree Absolutely. about research and methodology and whether or not someone like a Bud Hopkins or a David Jacobs are totally wrong in everything they did. Their approach was wrong. It doesn't matter. I'm not saying it is. I'm saying if it were true that they were totally wrong, That doesn't mean anything, because in the end, let's discuss it, let's try to deal with it. But in terms of abduction research, looking now, you know, post-Bud Hopkins era, what do we do to discover what's going on? Well, I think that in terms of ufology, I think that we have been in a post-abduction era for some time now. You know, I think the heyday of the abduction phenomenon, I think that we've entered a kind of uh, post-abduction era in ufology. The era of abductions was in the 1980s, maybe the early 1990s. And I think that we've kind of gone beyond that. That doesn't mean that we solved the mystery of what this phenomenon, which seems real enough, at least on an experiential level, is about. But I think that uh, there's no longer the, uh, the obsession with abductions. I don't think there are as many abduction reports as there used to be. It's still a puzzle. Over time, I came to disagree with the conclusions that Bud had had reached, but I 
so thought that Bud really had found something genuinely puzzling and very strange. It's just that I tended to believe that probably the cause was something other than, you know, literal extraterrestrial kidnappings. But I did respect Bud's work. I did respect his conclusions, even when I didn't agree with him. I mean, they were, his conclusions were arguable. But I think that there are other interpretations possible. Well, he sure did help a lot of people, that's for sure. Um, and, and you can never... You can never underestimate the importance uh, that he played in many people's lives. And as you pointed out, uh, Jerry, he really was a, a really sweet, funny, engaging man and just just a wonderful light. And, uh, you know, you can't you just can't put you know value on how much help he, he provided people. The day he died, I was I got work early in the morning and I was just shaken all day. And I I don't think that I've taken the, the death of a colleague that hard, maybe since Dick Hall a couple of years ago. Dick was also a good friend of mine. But these were two giants, and uh, Bud was extremely good to people. These were suffering people, and he found ways to bring them back into the world and, and find a way to live. And, uh, you, you know, I think that you know, he was a he was investigator, but in a way, he was also a healer. Yeah. And I I think that that history will be kind to Bud Hopkins. Yeah. Well, I think anybody that gets involved, uh, you know, out in the field working directly with experiencers, at some point realizes that they are providing. Uh, I've often equated myself uh, <laughs> at times as almost like a paranormal shrink because people generally don't really have any recourse. They can maybe talk with their family members or close friends, but a lot of these issues, you just can't take them to uh, to someone you don't know that well and discuss them. And, and I found that uh, quite a number of people that I've dealt with personally really appreciated that they could actually tell somebody what they felt they were going through with no fear of ridicule and no fear of judgment. And it's that, that objectivity that you really need to fine tune as someone that goes out in the field that um, I think really then becomes a, a very, very helpful uh, element in, in some of these people's lives. And, and Bud was a master at that. Yes, that's well said. I think that investigators, if they're decent or sensitive people at all, find that they also have a human responsibility, you know, beyond the, the responsibility of the investigator and the researcher. I think that we really need to think more about that. For example, I watch the way perfectly reasonable, normal, decent people come forward with a story, and then I watch them being savaged, even in the allegedly pro-UFO literature. I think of people like Travis Walton or Jesse Marcel, people like that, who are just ripped to pieces. And I think that is really wrong. Yeah. I remember one time going through um, a huge file that, that Nightcap had compiled on its investigation of the uh, West Virginia contactee Woody Durenberger. And there was a guy who was a psychiatrist who got peripherally involved in this complicated episode. And the NICAP investigator had even go had gone into this peripheral figure's personal life and even somehow had gotten his credit report and all this really deeply private and irrelevant stuff was in the file. And I thought, that's going way too far. Oh. I've never quite felt the need to do that, although I have checked into uh, a few ranches that I suspected of insurance fraud uh, for reporting livestock mutilated. But other than that, yeah, it's, you know. I, you I mean, I think that, that that's reasonable. But this guy, if you read his story, it was clear that this mental health professional had himself some kind of nervous breakdown. and And that's where his story of channeling aliens came from. It wasn't because he was lying. It was that he got so obsessed with Woody Durenberger that his own, you know, kind of mental, <laughs> he had a kind of mental breakdown, and it wasn't necessary to dig into his personal life. 
Yeah. You know, that's, there's, there's some lines that you just don't need to cross. There's just no, there's no point to it. Exactly. But isn't that part and parcel of the way our society works now where we don't just want to know about who and what a person is. We have to know about all their personal details, the deep, dark, and ugly details of their lives, and everybody has something that they'd like to live down. Exactly. I think there's this really sick compulsion just to destroy people. And, yeah. uh, it's, it's, and But, you know, you see it in the ufology, and, uh, you know, and, you know, these are people, when they come to us, and most of them are lying, most of them are crazy, they deserve, you know, our trust. They deserve to be treated decently. And unless you have some reason to believe that they're involved in some scam, and that happens sometimes, not often, you know, you treat them as decently and as considerately as possible. And you don't expose them to ridicule and personal devastation because that's really what they're trying to escape. What makes it difficult here is, of course, if you disagree with somebody, and this is something that... I think a lot of this we see on the Internet. You disagree with somebody, don't just say, here's why I disagree with you. You demonize them. You look for skeletons in their closet. You exploit it. You make a little thing into a big thing. Speaking of little things and big things, about big things, we talk about Jerry Clark and his work in the UFO field. I'm Gene Steinberg. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. You're in. Paracast. Are you tired of searching for great talk radio? Something more important. Search no more. We are the GCN Radio Network. Are you ready to order the official Paracast t-shirt? You asked, we answered. We're now taking orders for the official Paracast t-shirt. It comes in white, 100% cotton. The front of it features the same logo that we have on our community forums. On the back it says, separating signal from noise. To order the official Paracast t-shirt, here's all you have to do. Visit our new online store at store.theparacast.com. One more time, that's store.theparacast.com. You can use a major credit card to place your order for the official Paracast t-shirt. Hey, neighbors, we have one more thing to talk about, and that's more merchandise at the official Paracast store. We have hats, we have jackets, we even have a flip video camcorder customized with the Paracast logo at the official Paracast store. It's all now available at the official Paracast store, store store.theparacast.com. What nutrition are you missing that's leading to the four major diseases? cancer, arthritis, heart disease, and Parkinson's. There are at least 80,000 medical studies that show a lack of the protein glutathione to be linked to cancer, heart disease, Parkinson's, macular degeneration, lung disease, digestive diseases, diabetes, Alzheimer's, ALS, rheumatoid arthritis, and lupus. In all, at least 68 diseases. What is the number one food by which your body is most empowered to increase its glutathione production? It is undamaged whey protein from grass-fed cows. One World Whey is truly the first undamaged whey protein. All other whey protein powders are damaged by heat, chemicals, and filtration. One World Whey is the most life-giving whey protein powder ever produced. Call 888-988-3325. That's 888-988-3325. Or visit OneWorldWay.com. That's OneWorldWhey.com. Hi, I'm Mark Craighead, founder of Crossbreed Holsters. I designed our top-selling holster, the Super Tuck Deluxe, to solve the problems of being poked, pinched, and gouged while carrying concealed. The Super Tuck Deluxe is the most comfortable, most concealable holster on the market today. We offer a two-week free trial and a lifetime warranty. Visit us at CrossbreedHolsters.com. Don't forget, CrossbreedHolsters.com. 
Question. When the next disaster strikes, will you be ready? Answer. Yes. If you have top quality survival gear from the survivalzone.com, these days it's wise to keep a survival kit in your vehicle, home, and office. The survivalzone.com specializes in ready to go wilderness, 72 hour, and compact survival kits, plus freeze dried and dehydrated food, MREs, stun guns, non hybrid seeds, and much more. Call 603 838 5933 to be prepared with the survivalzone.com. We all know that Berkey Water Purification Systems are the most trusted name in water filtration. As an authorized Berkey dealer for over six years and serving thousands of satisfied customers, the Berkey Guy offers amazing specials for Berkey Water Filtration Systems. The Berkey Light Systems include a set of self-sterilizing and recleanable black purification elements that purify water by removing chlorine, pathogenic bacteria, cysts and parasites to non-detectable levels and remove harmful chemicals such as herbicides and pesticides. Order the Berkey Light Systems system today complete with two black berkey elements for only 231 dollars and the berkey guy will ship your order free of charge with the purchase of a berkey light the berkey guy is also offering a set of fluoride and arsenic filters for only 39.99 that's over 30 percent off the retail price call the berkey guy at 1-877-886-3653 that's 1-877-886-3653 or order online at goberkey.com that's goberkey.com today This is Leslie Kane, and I'm with the Coalition for Freedom of Information, and you are listening to the Paracast. Jerome Clark joins us, UFO historian. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast, and we're exploring the UFO field, and not just the cases and the stuff that we all hear about, but why we are so obsessed with the personalities. And how have you dealt with that over the years? Well, I had a strange experience on the UFO updates uh, email list uh, recently where a British skeptic that I've known for a long time and inspired with, but I always thought in, in you know basically a friendly fashion, uh, it just became clear to me at some point that he thought that he was right not just on the facts, but on the morality of it. That, that he was morally superior to people who disagree with him. Now, I don't find that that's the case. I can disagree with people and think that they're perfectly decent people, and, and this is not personal. And most of these arguments aren't personal. I mean, the UFO phenomenon is incredibly complicated and controversial. And people are going to have different opinions about it. And all of those differing opinions aren't unreasonable. The reasonable people can look at this and come to different kinds of reasonable conclusions. And that this doesn't speak to you as a moral human being. It just speaks to that particular part of the UFO phenomenon that you think defines it. And that's why people disagree, because they focus on A or B, and somebody else is focusing on C or D. And there's plenty there. You know, there's just, you know, there's a lot to find there. And, every, and, and opinions differ because people differ on what's important there. What is defining about UFO data? But it has nothing to do with their character. Well, I guess the concern about someone's character is if they're defrauding you. If they're stealing your money, if they're lying about what they yeah. experience, I guess you are concerned about the flaws in their character. But if somebody just has a claim that you may disagree with, it doesn't mean they're a bad person. And I think even no. in our politics, it's like that these days. Yes. Yeah, it, it, you know, there's people in this field, because of their little narrow focus, tend to think that what goes on in ufology is unique. In fact, it's just very typical human behavior that plays out all across the spectrum of human behavior. You know, the feuds, the intolerance, the craziness, the, the occasional dishonesty, and just a simple, you know, honest difference of opinion. That's just, that's all human. Ufologists, if nothing else, are human beings, acting like human beings. And they just happen to be in, say, the wrong place or the right place at the right time, and that's it. Well, it's like, you know, it's like, the, you know, the three of us, you know, we're, we're here just through circumstance. When we were young and impressionable, 
we saw something or we read a book or, you know, so here we are, you know, many years later in this, you know, this strange little place. Just a couple and, of old codgers. And, of course, Chris, who's the young person in our group. So two old men, one very young man, just kind of talking about what's going on. Right. And maybe we and should... And it, it could have all been different. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that interesting about the differences, about the fact that on the long haul, if several things didn't happen, to me, I would maybe never have been involved in UFO research if my brother hadn't left a copy of a book by Major Donald Kehoe, Flying Saucers from Outer Space, on his living room coffee table. Maybe I wouldn't have become interested. It's as simple yeah, as that. I hadn't, uh, yeah. I hadn't joined the science fiction book club in 1957 and gotten uh, Ed Ruppelt's report on unidentified flying objects. And this was a subject that I had given no thought to whatsoever before. But if I had read my first UFO book had been George Adamski's Flying Saucers Have Landed, even at that young and tender age, I would have seen this as ridiculous and silly. And if I had read Adamski first, I would have just written the whole subject off and gone on to whatever I was going to do if I hadn't read Ruppelt first. Do you think that you would have chosen a different profession? I mean, not just writing about UFOs, but all the other things you did in your life, writing music. I think that I probably would have become an academic historian if uh, I hadn't discovered UFOs. That's really my major interest in life, is, is, along with uh, you know, roots music, which I'm fairly expert on at this point in my life. But I read mostly history, and that's always interested me. And in fact, I was able to, to combine my interest in history with my interest in ufology. Encyclopedia series was about. It's just a great big, you know, historical survey. Well, that's an interesting thing too. Looking at your historical perspective, and this is one of the reasons why we'd like to bring you on. Looking at the changes in the UFO mystery and UFO research. Now, I think today, and now you can disagree with me all you want, but I see. Sometimes we're playing out the same scenario as the 1950s, where Major Donald Kehoe was talking about the silence group, the government knows the secret, let's have what he would, you know, have called his version of disclosure. So now we seek disclosure all over again. Is that history repeating itself? People forgetting the lessons of history? What? I think that what's happening in ufology today is pretty much all of the UFO history is being replayed right now. That, that every strain that is part of the UFO controversy over the, over the decades is out there now. There's, there are people who are focused on nuts and bolts and the, and the extraterrestrial hypothesis. There are people for the paranormal. There are the new age types. Um, there are people obsessed with government secrecy and the, uh, you know alleged knowledge of crash disks and so on. All these things are, are themes that have played out in the field. I think the one difference is that by now there actually is, you know, a, a, a small but impressive library of actual, you know, scholarly work and analysis. And, and, and although most of what's published about UFOs and anomalies is still flawed at best, there really are good books out there. There are good papers and there are good people, and um, and that's what will last. The rest of it is just kind of extraneous. It's just a social movement playing itself out. But the real scholarship, the real research, will stand, and that's what people will be looking at, you know, 50 years from now, 100 years from now. Well, let's just take a look at that. As far as the social aspect, why is it that people get attracted to UFOs because of the mystery, the lure of maybe coming up with E.T., meeting E.T.? Well, I think the subject is just inherently interesting. You know, mysteries of any kind are interesting. And this is a mystery that seems particularly impenetrable. And, um, you know, it, people get into it and they think, yeah, I'm going to have this solved. I can, nobody else can solve it. I'm going to solve it. And by the time they realize they're not going to solve it, they're hooked they're either hooked or they're just giving up in frustration. Now, Gene, you know, over the years, all the people we've seen come in the door and go out. 
And there are a few of us who have remained in the building. But we are resigned. to We're not going to know the answer. In, in my own head, I have found answers that I can live with. But, you know, I also know that I could be wrong. But I can live with that. Now, as far as the social aspect, what's their purpose? What's their reason? Well, I think it just, you know, people, I don't know. I can't read people's minds. I mean, I just think that, that it's just a mystery. Basically, that's what that drives people. And either they can they they can live with mystery or they can't. If they can live with mystery, if they can live with uncertainty and ambiguity, they will stay interested. If they can't, they will go elsewhere, maybe to some place where they are more likely to get an answer. But I think that with the UFO phenomenon, we're dealing with something that is beyond current knowledge. And you know that you're going to get only so far, and you're not going to get further. And you're going to see the thing play itself over and over and over again to the point of monotony. I mean, I was reading something that I think Roger Marsh of MUFON wrote the other day. He said that most UFO reports are still pretty boring. <laughs> that just struck me. But yeah, a lot of this by now is boring. We've just seen it replay itself continually. doesn't mean we understand it, but we understand how it happens, how it works. I think that the ufology has established that much, that we know how this thing works. We don't know what it is, but we know how it works. Well, speaking of knowing how things work, this is how this works. You're listening to the Paracast with Gene Steinberg and Christopher O'Brien. If you have a comment or a question, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. Our guest is UFO historian Jerome Clark. We're trying to set things in perspective so you'll understand where we are, how we got here, and maybe where we're going. You're in the Paracast. The GCN Radio Network, providing the world with hard-hitting talk radio. GCN. Great talk radio starts here. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. If you own an Apple iPhone and love to listen to your favorite programs on GCN, I've got good news for you. I'm proud to announce that GCN has a brand new iPhone app available for our dedicated listeners at GCNlive.com. Listen to your favorite hard-hitting GCN programs live or on demand right on your iPhone. And the best part? The GCN iPhone app can be yours absolutely free. Download the iPhone app today by clicking on the banner at GCNlive.com. Again, that's GCNlive.com. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. Have you ever wondered why banks, stockbrokers, and Investment advisors want to talk about gold IRAs? They've been available since 1986, yet the financial industry won't recognize the value of gold for your retirement. Gold has outperformed paper investments, yet no word about IRAs. If you would like to have gold for your retirement, call 800-686-2237. Don't get left behind by rising inflation and low returns. Call 800-686-2237. Secure your future and call 1-800-686-2237. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. As we continue with the second hour of the Paracast, our guest Jerome Clark, I'm Gene Steinberg, and we're exploring the UFO field about attitudes. Now, looking at the prevailing opinions in UFO field. We had the belief that E.T. was coming, that E.T. was here, and then kind of in the 60s and 70s, maybe part of the counterculture, we started looking into other possibilities such as UFOs from other dimensions, UFOs from the inner Earth, all sorts of uh, different kinds of explanations. So where is that gone? Is it still here? Well, I think the, uh, at least for some of the UFO phenomena, the ETH is probably in better shape than it's ever been. And that's because of the escalating discovery of extrasolar planets, many of them Earth-likes, and some of them within reasonably close distance of the Earth, for example, about 36 million light years in, in a recent discovery. I think that if the galaxy is indeed densely populated, the presence of uh, extraterrestrial visitors is almost to be expected. I think that the ETH will be validated, but it, it, but there are, 
that's not the entire UFO question, and, and the rest of it is probably a lot more difficult. But I do think that, that as was suspected by a few in 1947, we may indeed be seeing evidence of an ET presence. I think that's a perfectly reasonable uh, inference. But it doesn't explain you know, the, the really the stuff that came along in the latter 1960s, the, the highly strange stuff that seems to have you know, paranormal aspects and it was just surreal and weird. That sort of stuff doesn't fit so well into a, into the ETH. And that has to be dealt with, I think, perhaps as a separate question. Um, just a little kind of an update here. I recently spoke with a couple of folks that have um, had conversations recently with Jacques Vallée. And both, uh, unbeknownst to one another, made the comment that uh, Vallée is being slowly drawn back towards the center there uh, in relation to the regards to the ETH. So perhaps some of those early out-of-the-box theorists, um, like Valet, now with uh, you know the evidence of these Goldilocks planets, as uh, Jerry just brought up, maybe that and a combination of other elements is starting to make people sort of drift back in that direction who have been staunchly anti-ETH uh, uh, for many years in the case of Valet. That's very interesting you said. I hadn't heard that. I, in fact, when I reviewed Valet's last book, which he wrote with Chris Aubach, I criticized Valet for not having had in a, a fresh idea in, in decades because I thought that, that uh, I went, when I look back from what I was thinking in 1969 when Valet's Passport to Magonia, which was a hugely influential book, came out. You know, I, my ideas have evolved fairly radically over time. But I'm glad to hear that, and I, I hope that's true. You know, I don't really know Jacques that well. I do know that he's always knocking me in his books. But I basically like the guy, and I think that he's basically been a positive influence. He's knocked you in his great. books? How so? Is, how's he knocking me? Have you read his latest book? Well, okay, I think we need to explain to our listeners exactly what's going on. It's not, have you read the book, because they haven't read the book. Okay, well, he is criticize me and he often criticizes me in his books for saying the ETH has to be considered extraterrestrial hypothesis and he in his books maintains that that is a closed question that only foolish people like Jerome Clark would argue that the ETH still deserves to be considered <laughs> and uh, if, if, if it is true that Jacques Delay is reconsidering his thought I think that that speaks well of him that all of us should you know, re-examine our, our opinions and our beliefs and, and see how well they measure up. And I think that, that any mature, sensible adult does that every day. <laughs> and well, I, I think, I mean, I, I like Jacques, and I think that he's been a positive influence, but if he's think, rethinking, that's good. Well, I must say, any alien species that would bother to waste any time, effort, resources, and energy coming to this primitive, violent, misogynist planet. Um, I just got to wonder about the motivations. Well, intellectual curiosity. I mean, uh, you know, we, 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 you know, anthropologists go to remote places to study, you know, tribal societies. And uh, no, I think that, that is, there are all kinds of reasons to come here, and I'm sure they're going elsewhere, too. It's just, you know, they're curious. They want to know, you know, what, how, how is life evolving in the universe? What happens when it reaches the point that it has found ways, for example, to destroy itself? You know, we could destroy ourselves with nuclear weapons or environmental devastation. I mean, we're at a real crossroads. That might be interesting to extraterrestrial visitors. Maybe there's like some sort of uh, galactic uh, Las Vegas, and they're they're placing odds on how soon it'll be before we totally uh, <laughs> annihilate ourselves with uh, either pollution, nuclear weapons, uh, you know, some sort of uh, biological agent that gets out of hand uh, that's ill-advisedly used or something. Maybe there's like a, a bookie out there that's giving uh, chips to pe for people to update their bets and and uh, put new money down as the odds go up that we're not going to survive much longer. <laughs> like the character in one of the Star Trek series, Quark, who was a Ferengi, that was the race he came from, and he was, shall we say, the wheeler-dealer of the crew there. Nobody else cared about money, but he did. Right. <laughs> well, I think that, uh, that we have about a century to uh, clean up the 
clean up our act, or I don't think we're going to survive. I mean, I don't think that. I mean, I'm not a paranoid. I'm not an alarmist, but I, um, I think that you know we have a century to clean up our act at most. And we're real. We're in real trouble. I mean, global warming alone is going to have an enormous impact and a broader one than most people understand because we'll have economic and political and all kinds of implications which will be destructive. And uh, we just, if extraterrestrials are watching, I think that that they may want to see whether we're going to survive this. If we survive the next hundred years, we probably will survive. If we don't, we won't. So, I mean, there are all kinds of interesting things that, that, that they could be studying about us. So, so where do you think the odds are right now? What's, what are the odds? If you had to make book on this, what, what would the odds be? I am not optimistic. Uh, my friend uh, Michael Swords is a retired uh, professor of environmental science at Western Michigan University. And Mike was telling me 20 years ago that, uh, that global warming was coming a lot faster and it was going to be a lot worse than you were reading in the newspaper. And we're seeing that playing out, that in, that in fact it is coming much faster, and its consequences are even worse than was thought at the, at the at 20 years ago. And, um, you know, we don't even have the political will to deal with global warming. And you yeah. even have a one political party that insists it doesn't exist. I mean, how, how can you deal with that if you won't even acknowledge that it's a problem? Well, when the sea levels start to rise and, and uh, land values in Bangladesh and Florida start to plummet, then uh, I think that'll be a wake-up call for a lot of people. And whole islands disappear under the water. Right. And and the populations of those islands head off to New Zealand and other settled, stable, prosperous countries. How are they going to deal with the sudden influx of many thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of poor people living on Pacific or Atlantic islands. You know, this is going to precipitate in itself a huge crisis. It's going to cause drought in Africa, which is already happening, massive starvation, uh, conflict over food and water. Water, you know, especially. Things get really bad. Yeah, and uh, we, you know, and so, you know, we're entering an incredibly perilous time. And as a father, I have three children. I, you know, I worry about what kind of world they're going to be living in. Let me ask you a fast question here, which may be just as important, and that is, with regard to the presence of UFOs, is there a possibility they're aware, which is of course what some people believe, of the things we can do to mess ourselves up? And they're either here, as maybe was suggested before, to take bets or to stop us. We have Jerome Clark. This is Gene Steinberg. The co-host is Chris O'Brien. You're in. The Paracast. So here's what happened. I was placing an order online. The site went down. It just stopped responding. It took hours before it returned, but I'd already placed the order with another company. If your site goes down, you could lose business. And if you have a business or personal site, you'll want to know it's easy to run and it will stay online. At iWeb, your site is hosted on one of the most reliable networks in the world. Check it out. iWeb.com. That's iWeb.com. Fake Magazine provides true reports of the strange and unknown. Keep up with the latest on angels and miracles, psychic phenomena, ghosts, UFOs, life after death, and much, much more. To receive your free issue of Fake Magazine, call now at 1-800-728-2730 or visit their website at www.fakemag.com. That's 1-800-728-2730. What are you waiting for? Your fate awaits. Are you wondering about your retirement portfolio? Are you confident that the financial advisor is experienced enough to combat climbing interest rates, taxes, and inflation? Stop guessing and go to the expert, Robert Chapman of the International Forecaster. When you subscribe to the International Forecaster, you get Robert Chapman's 45 years of experience and concise investment recommendations. Who needs sugar-coated excuses when you can get the cold hard facts and proven investment leads you can't get anywhere else? For a free introductory copy to Robert Chapman's International Forecaster, Subscribe now at theinternationalforecaster.com or call 877-479-8178. Experience the difference. 
When you subscribe, you can email Robert Chapman directly to obtain investment advice tailored just for you. Don't wait another minute. Subscribe today at the internationalforecaster.com or call 877-479-8178. That's 877-479-8178. We all know that Berkey Water Purification Systems are the most trusted name in water filtration. As an authorized Berkey dealer for over six years and serving thousands of satisfied customers, the Berkey Guy offers amazing specials for Berkey Water Filtration Systems. The Berkey Light Systems include a set of self-sterilizing and recleanable black purification elements that purify water by removing chlorine, pathogenic bacteria, cysts and parasites to non-detectable levels and remove harmful chemicals such as herbicides and pesticides. Order the Berkey Light Systems system today complete with two black Berkey elements for only $231 and the Berkey guy will ship your order free of charge. With the purchase of a Berkey light, the Berkey guy is also offering a set of fluoride and arsenic filters for only $39.99. That's over 30% off the retail price. Call the Berkey guy at 1-877-886-3653. That's 1-877-886-3653 or order online at goberkey.com. That's goberkey.com today. With economic and job-based stress now the leading cause of illness, is your body ready for the hard times ahead? This is Bill Hyde with a special report on staying healthy in hard times. According to a new article in the London Telegraph, job stress associated with the economic downturn has now replaced cancer, stroke, heart attack, and back problems as the number one reason people miss work. In fact, it's now being called the black death of our time. This means taking care of your body could be the single most important thing you do, especially in these hard economic times. Recently, we've created a video which you can watch online for free detailing how to make sure your body is ready for the dangerous times we live in. You can find the video at longtermgreen.com. That's longtermgreen.com. Get your body ready for the hard times ahead by watching the free video at longtermgreen.com. The video is available at longtermgreen.com. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at the paracast.com that's news at the paracast.com and if you'd like to catch up on past episodes we have hundreds of shows for you to download direct from the paracast.com that's the paracast.com or check us out at itunes With Jerome Clark, with Gene and Chris in the PowerCast, the question on the table, do you think if E.T. is here, that E.T. knows that we're at the crossroads, we have to get our acts together, or there will be no civilization, knowing that, does E.T. care about doing something about it, just watching disinterestedly or putting a stop to it? Well, of course, we have no idea. You know, we can only speculate, and we can be speculating with very little evidence. As far as I can tell, you know, just assuming for the sake of discussion that we're dealing with extraterrestrial visitors, I don't know that for certain, but let's speculate here. We don't see anything in their behavior that indicates that they have an emotional connection with us and are concerned about our fate. They don't seem to be hostile. They could take us over probably very easily. If they wanted to, they don't seem to care to do that. They just seem to be watching us. And their motives remain inscrutable. So Grandfather Martin of the Hopi uh, said, kind of volunteered one day when I was speaking with him about Hopi prophecy, uh, he whipped out this Aztec codices, which uh, was quite lengthy. It's about six feet long, um, you know, reproduced on paper. And at the very end where he says we are in, at the end of the fourth world here, their sergeant in arms is banging humanity on the head from behind with a club. And right above the little potential conflict at the very end of this whole series of glyphs is this little Mexican sombrero hanging in the air. And I asked him, I said, uh, Grandfather, what is that? He goes, oh, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, those silver ships that fly around. And I said, well, what do the Hopi say about them? Uh, What can you tell me about them? Why are they here? And he says, oh, they're just watching. And I said, well, what are they watching? He goes, they're just watching. <laughs> That's all he would say. 
Uh, you know, in, in typical Native American fashion, uh, you know, I, I guess words speak volumes, but I've always kind of had a sense that um, they're they're almost, I, I don't know, you know, I'm just kind of riffing here a little bit, but um, I would think that the biodiversity on this planet would be the, the attraction to anything from out there, that humans actually are a virus, uh, like Agent yes. Smith in the Matrix says, humans are a virus, you know. We're the ones that are really damaging the ecosystem and you know, I don't know how many species are, uh, I forget the figure, how many species go extinct every day, but a large, in large part that's due to um, to humans and, and cattle, for that matter. Um, cattle are very detrimental to the planet. So perhaps it's the ecosystem, it's the, the wonderful biodiversity here on Earth that is the, the main attraction, and we're kind of like in the way. Yes, uh, scientists uh, have said that we're living at the end of nature. They've also said that nature always gets the last word. And if we're a virus, and sometimes it, it certainly looks that way, you know, the body cleans itself of the virus. And uh, if we're going to destroy ourselves because of our carelessness with the natural world, we are going to pay for that. And we, then we will disappear and then nature will repair itself, and maybe the whole the whole cycle will repeat itself. Some kind of human-like form will evolve again, many, many millions of years down the line. And, but it, it it it's really terrifying. And I, up until a few years ago, I was just basically philosophically an optimist. But you look around, and there are plenty of things to be frightened of and worried about, and alarmed about. And uh, hey, we're just living in a world that is sorely ailing. Yeah, tenuous times. Well, it almost starts to make you think that there's an end game here. Maybe that's why people believe in a 2012, that it's all going to come to an end or come to a head in 2012. Do you think that's part of it? And do you think well, the UFO presence, and this gets to be mystical again, has anything to do with that? Well... I don't know, of course. I mean, how, how you know? How, how could you say? You know, I'm I'm skeptical of, you know, mystical thinking and prophecy and those sorts of things. They don't really seem to have worked out very well in the course of history. But I do think that that UFOs are here. They have some purpose, which we may not know, and we can only speculate about. But um, and I also think that the human race is in a perilous state now. Whether all those things are related, who knows? Well, we all need Michael Rainey to come down in his spaceship, say, I am clad too. Take me to your leader, or Gort's going to kill everybody. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah something like that. I guess we kind of need that. Chris, we've gotten a number of questions from our audience about Jerry Clark's appearance this week. Can you dig out a few? Let's get started on those. Okay. I'm actually uh, enjoying this uh, session because I'm not, I'm able to walk around and and uh, do some things. I'm not stuck at my desk on the Skype uh, scenario, but I do uh, have a question uh, from the form that I kind of remember from reading them, and that is uh, the encyclopedia. Is there, you know, it's been almost 10 years since uh, it was published, I think the last edition, and uh, are there any plans to abridge it or bring it up to date, or do you have any plans in that that regard for a new new edition of it? Well, um, that would be, of course, entirely up to the publisher, and I really don't think it's going to happen. Uh, one concern is that the publisher is, like virtually all other reference publishers, has been reduced to a shadow of itself by the Internet. The Internet has devastated the reference book in Amazon. My wife, my wife worked in the reference book industry. In fact, she was my, encyc my editor on the UFO Encyclopedia, and that's but how we met. But um, she she worked for 26 years in the industry, and and, she, and she, she and a whole bunch of people got downsized. So there really isn't a market for reference books anymore. People just go to Wikipedia. And so no, I don't think there will. Uh, my my only hope is that somebody will publish an unabridged paperback, affordable version of the second yeah. edition of the encyclopedia. That would so be that, great it would be available to people. And that's the most that I hope for. There was, a, yeah. I was or, approached or streaming, by... Streaming, uh, they could stream down and download, like a, a, a Kindle or an e-version. Something, yeah, something like that. 
but that's all I can say about that. Well, the other thing, of course, we can do nowadays, Jerry, is you can do print on demand. Of course, you have the rights to do it, which, of course, is another question entirely, that you can do print on demand where some of these companies will actually fulfill your orders for you. You take the orders in, and they will print whatever copies they need and right. mail them to the recipient, and you get your commission every month. Yeah, that would be up to the publisher, of course. The publisher owns a copyright, so I, want, I don't have any say in that. Well, I think the standard contract is that they own the rights to it until two years after it's out of print, and then it reverts back to you. I'd check your fine print on that. Yeah, it's still in print. Oh, well, that's good. That's very good. Well, that yeah, I came. actually sometimes hear from people who have, who have ordered a copy, which is always amazing to me, that was published in 1998. So they right. basically have a little warehouse or a garage, and they stuck a few copies in there, and they're still available. We have Jerome Clark, who's visiting the garage now looking for copies of the book. With Gene and Chris, you're in... America's number one source for independent talk radio for over a decade. We are the GCN Radio Network. Ray Perkins, a reclusive veteran burned out from the Gulf War, lives tortured by relentless, perplexing nightmares. Nightmares of a horrific battle in deep space and of a mysterious woman suffering in agony for her devastated world. A woman not yet born, calling across centuries to him. Then... A coincidence leads him to his destiny, his chance to alter the universe. Attack Attack of the Rockaway. The former fiction editor for Star Wars and Indiana Jones, Robert Simpson, writes, The soul of the novel Attack of the Rockoids lies in its heart and passion for building a convincing tale of a love that spans the galaxy. A thrilling story. Attack Attack of the Rockaway is available now. Read a sample chapter and get a special discount off of the cover price at our website, rockoids.com. That's R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S. Dot com. Attack, attack of the Rockaway, a novel in the grand science fiction tradition. If you constantly feel run down and tired, your pH level might be low and your body could be full of toxins. If what you drink is not at a pH level of 8 or higher, you are inviting bacteria and acid to thrive in your body. But there is something you can do. Simply add 10 drops of AlkaVision Plasma pH drops to your water to help your body rid itself of acidic waste, increase oxygen, and raise your pH balance to optimum levels. AlkaVision Plasma pH drops combine a unique formula of the most alkaline minerals in the world. Alkalizing the water you you drink, ridding your body of acidic waste and toxins, and helping you regain energy and vibrant health. And studies show viruses, bacteria, and toxins cannot survive in an alkaline, high pH environment. Order your bottle of AlkaVision Plasma pH drops at AlkaVision.com. That's A L K A Vision.com. Or call 269 409 1776. 269 409 1776. Alkalize your body. Supercharge your health at AlkaVision.com today. Big Berkey water filters are in high demand. Storable foods are also in high demand. BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com has always kept our focus on the Berkey water filter products. But increasingly, our customers have been asking for storable foods. After months of research, BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com now offers great-tasting, long-lasting, storable foods. These ready-to-eat meals are packed in airtight nitrogen pouches. All you do is just add water. And because they're sealed so well, they come with a 25-year shelf life. Combine Combine our Berkey water filters, which are powerful enough to purify treated, untreated, or even stagnant pond water with our storable foods, and you have a winning combination. Remember, we offer free shipping on every order over $50, and GCN listeners receive 5% off all ceramic filter systems. Visit Big B-E-R-K-E-Y waterfilters.com or call 877-99-BERKEY. That's Big Berkey waterfilters.com or call 877-99-BERKEY today. If you owe the IRS money you can't pay, then listen carefully, because you already know that the problem won't go away by itself. You can get help today from the leading tax expert in the country, Dan Pilla. Hi, I'm Dan Pilla. The IRS isn't going to just forget about you. Right now, the IRS is hiring thousands of tax collectors to go after delinquent accounts just like yours. That's why you need to take action today, and I can help. I take a simple but proven approach to solving your tax debt problem. 
First, I stabilize collections so you don't have to worry about wage and bank levies. Next, I build a detailed plan to get your debt reduced to the fullest extent possible, sometimes even eliminated. Finally, I work with you every step of the way to get your problem solved once and for all. So call now for a free consultation. Call 1-800-346-6829. Dan Pilla will solve your tax problem guaranteed. He's helped thousands of people, and he can help you too. Call us today at 800-346-6829. That's 800-34-NO-TAX. This is Kurt Seven, the author of UFO Mysteries, and you're listening to the Paracast. We're envisioning now Jerry Clark going into his garage, several boxes of books. That's what I used to do, you know. When I would write all those computer books, I wrote about 28 or 30 computer books. And because of the nature of software and operating systems and hardware, they were out of date in like nine months. If you were lucky, if you wrote the book fast enough. And so I'd get bunches of copies, and it reached a point where the publisher had none. They just dumped them in the outlet bins. The <laughs> And... I had maybe 20 or 50 copies, and I'd sell them off, you know, have a little side business going. Let's go to another question. Well, that first question was from Ufology, uh, who's a a fairly recent addition to the Paracast Forum family. This question is from Digital Trickster, who is a new Paracast uh, Forum poster. And I must say, Digital Trickster, your avatar is truly frightening. By the way, he chose the name Digital Trickster. Let me just tell you the rest of the story here because of you. Yeah, oh boy. I'm not sure if that's a good thing. Looking at this avatar, I'll tell you, if you cross a leprechaun with a rabid alien having a bad day, that's what his little avatar image looks like. It's pretty frightening. But his question, Gene, is uh, for Jerry, is what is your opinion on the Phoenix Lights incident? Uh, is, is question one, and and that's something I'm not sure if we've discussed. I think it may have been mentioned in a prior appearance uh, here, but have you looked into that case, and, and have you come to any conclusions in your own mind about what it could possibly have been? Obviously, it's a very complex, you know, probably incident with two distinct uh, aspects to it, but what is your thinking on that? Well, I haven't looked into it, and I, my opinion is it's purely an amateur's opinion. You know, our Leslie Kane, in a very good book on UFOs, has a chapter on it, and it seems to me she handles it pretty well, that there was an aspect that was genuinely puzzling and probably, you know, a sighting of UFOs, and there was another part. I think that I don't really have a strong opinion. I think my opinion is Leslie Kane's opinion. Leslie Kane, in her very good book, has a chapter on it, and I think the consensus is that some of the sightings I believe the ones earlier in the evening were of UFOs, and the other ones may not, later may not have been. But I really, you know, I haven't really looked into that. You know, I, you know, my interest when I was writing the encyclopedia was really on, you know, cases from a long ago, like uh, one that sort of related to that was the Lubbock Lights from Texas in 1951, which was somewhat comparable to the Phoenix Lights. In other words, you know, formations of lights in the night sky, photographs taken, widely seen, and, you know, just ensuing complicated controversy about what caused these sightings. And uh, when I wrote about the Lubbock Lights, and there's quite a long entry in my encyclopedia about them, I felt sort of like a detective going, sorting through all the clues, all the evidence, and going back and forth, and, and, and finally deciding, yes, these were indeed UFOs. And, but I know more about the Lubbock Lights than I know about the Phoenix Lights, I'm afraid. For listeners who basically tuned in late to the UFO thing, I like to always ask our guests when they refer to a sighting, and this is one that, of course, we've all read about very often. The Lubbock Lights, in a couple of minutes or less, explain the case to people. Well, this occurred in the summer of 1951, and it basically involved people began seeing in the evening these huge light formations flying silently over the city of Lubbock. They were seen by a lot of people, including scientists were among the, the, the sighters, and uh, 
series of very famous photographs were taken by Carl Hart Jr., who at the time was a college student in Lubbock, and was re-interviewed many years later by Kevin Randall and others. He stuck by the story, an upright man. And uh, the pro- uh, Project Grudge hadn't become Blue Book yet. Project Grudge sent investigators, and they went all around interviewing people and collecting the testimony. And um, the the this, the conclusion was that this was indeed unexplained, that these really genuinely were mysterious. Well, in later years, as Blue Book was trying to clear up everything and and explain everything in sight, the story became that they had seen lights reflecting off moths, which I don't think persuaded anybody. But yeah, that's um, a, anyway, it's a, great, it's a great case. And, 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 and really good photographs, too. One of the, the better uh, photograph cases. And as you mentioned, quite a number of witnesses came forward uh, to that event. It was quite widely seen. It, the Lubbock lights were the photograph that Carl Hart Jr. took is actually on the cover of Ed Ruppelt's book, which was the first UFO book that I read. And he has a chapter on the Lubbock Lights in his book and and, and the investigation the Air Force did of, of them. Well, um, Mr. Digital Trickster has a couple of other questions. Uh, the second one is, who do you consider to be the best researchers in the field today? Besides yourself. Oh, boy. <laughs> That's a tough one. Well, I mean, there are some very good people. Um, you know, I'm a, my organizational affiliation is with the Center for UFO Studies in Chicago, and I have enormous regard for my colleagues in that field, including Mark Rodiger, who's the scientific director of the organization, uh, Eddie Bullard, who is the folklorist, who wrote a very good book, which the University Press of Kansas published last year about UFOs and folklore, and um, the late Stuart Appel, who was a board member, a psychologist who studied uh, the abduction phenomenon and wrote about it for the academic press, wrote some of the best writing I've ever seen on the subject. Um, you know, there's Chris Rutkowski up in Manitoba, who's a very good, hard-working researcher. And there's Don Ledger in uh, Nova Scotia. Uh, oh, boy. Robert Powell down in Texas. I mean, there's some really good people. You know, I want to ask you a I, question when you raise that. Center for UFO Studies. I don't hear about them much anymore. What are they doing these days? Surviving. Um it, the, the International UFO Report, a new issue, just has come out this week. It has a piece that I wrote in, in remembrance of Bud Hopkins and, uh, and other material. You see some of the best research published in the in International UFO Report, or IUR as we call it. You see solid articles, historical articles, investigative articles, uh, speculative writing. There, there's a real good writing and intellectual discipline in IUR. I think it's the best of the surviving UFO magazines. Of course, the Internet has changed everything. So there's a Center for UFO Studies uh, website, of course, where you can go and get some sense of what the center is doing, what its resources are. It, it, I wrote much of the UFO encyclopedia out of the center archives, which are voluminous, including Blue Book, NICAP, all kinds of forgotten UFO organizations that collected materials in the 50s and 60s, Condon material, it's an enormous resource. But, you know, it's surviving on a you know, shoestring, just like all surviving UFO organizations. And, well, um, well, you know, I think we'd like to have the Center for UFO Studies come on the Paracast. I think we can have a fascinating discussion with some of those people. And maybe we could work it out with you and the people there to expose their work to a wider audience because we don't hear from them much anymore. And that's why I asked you the question. I said, you know, what are they doing? Well, as I said, you know, Mark Mark Rodiger is the scientific director. He lives in Chicago. And, uh, you know, you'd have to ask him. But, um, you know, Mark's 
very smart guy. He said he has a PhD in sociology and uh, was, you know, uh, worked with Dr. Heinick. And that's how I met him. Sure thing. And the market done a good job. We have Jerome Clark, UFO historian. You're listening to Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. Are you tired of searching for great talk radio? Something more important. Search no more. We are the GCN Radio Network. Graphic Converter is the image manipulation tool for the rest of us. It does not use any database. You get full control of all your files. Want to view the images of a folder? Drag it into Graphic Converter, and a powerful browser opens up to show your image files. You could use it for slideshows. You could use it to import images from digital cameras or from scanners. Need to do some image editing? You can do that, too, in Graphic Converter. Also, print catalogs. Convert from so many formats, I can't even list them. Download now to see if Graphic Converter is good for you, like one and a half million other users. Guess what? You could save money when you buy Graphic Converter. Use the coupon code NIGHTOWL. Use the coupon code NIGHTOWL to get a special price for Graphic Converter. Go to LemkeSoft.com. That's L-E-M-K-E Soft.com. LemkeSoft.com. L-E-M-K-E Soft.com. How would you like to have normal blood pressure? This is Ernesto from Illinois. I had my doctor's appointment yesterday, and I got my labs in. My HDL is 119L, and my LDL is 37L. My doctor asked what I was doing to lower it so much, so I told her about HB Extract. Millions of people like Ernesto are suffering from high blood pressure, congestive heart failure, unbalanced cholesterol, irregular heartbeats, and clogged arteries. But now there's an effective, natural, 100% organic nutritional supplement for a healthy heart and circulation. Heart and Body Extract. My blood pressure has not gone past 125 over 80 in almost a month. Experience amazing benefits when your body gets what it needs with the assistance of Heart and Body Extract. She did a double take when she looked at my ER labs. She couldn't believe it. Order at HBExtract.com or call 866-295-5305. That's HBExtract.com or call 866-295-5305. Thank you. Heart and Body Extract. Hi, I'm Mark Craighead, founder of Crossbreed Holsters. I designed our top-selling holster, the Super Tuck Deluxe, to solve the problems of being poked, pinched, and gouged while carrying concealed. The Super Tuck Deluxe is the most comfortable, most concealable holster on the market today. We offer a two-week free trial and a lifetime warranty. Visit us at CrossbreedHolsters.com. Don't forget, CrossbreedHolsters.com. Question. When the next disaster strikes, will you be ready? Answer. Yes. If you have top quality survival gear from the survivalzone.com, these days it's wise to keep a survival kit in your vehicle, home, and office. The survivalzone.com specializes in ready to go wilderness, 72 hour, and compact survival kits, plus freeze dried and dehydrated food, MREs, stun guns, non hybrid seeds, and much more. Call 603 838 5933 to be prepared with the survivalzone.com. Steve Shank here with a special alert from eFoods Direct. The stock market continues to crash and recrash daily. Since July, the market has dropped 15% with no signs of recovery. What does that mean to you? When stocks crash, jobs are lost, and you can't buy the food that's already too expensive and continues to raise in costs. eFoods just got noticed that wholesale costs on pasta, rice, and beans will immediately jump 20%. The already high cost of sugar is tripling. If you invest in the stock market for security or save money in the bank, you can Continue to see the dollar drop in value while your weekly food bills increase. So what are you going to do? Get as much food now as you can. With these problems you're facing, eFoods Direct has no choice but to extend the free shipping another week to October 9th. Free shipping buys more food with shipping dollars. Call 800-409-5633 or go to eFoodsDirect.com slash Alex. Call 800-409-5633 or eFoodsDirect.com slash Alex. You can bet your life on eFoods Direct. This is Jim Mosley, editor of Saucer Smear, and I'm here to say a good word or two about the Paracast, which I believe is the gold standard of paranormal radio. Listen to it if you can. So we find that 
Chris O'Brien ought to have a lavalier microphone when he communicates with Skype so he can walk around the room. He's not stuck in one place. Maybe we can get you a, kind of a portable Bluetooth headset, Chris, okay? There you go. Okay. We'll have to look at that. Have one of our members donate one. We're talking to Jerome Clark, UFO historian. We're asking the questions you asked of Jerry when we announced that his appearance would be on this week's show. Let's go back to the questions, Chris. Well, Digital Trickster has one more, and this is going to be, uh, I'm not sure if, if there's really uh, an answer for this, but what is your favorite case to date? Do you, you know, have I one? Think it, I, I think the single most evidential case, and it's really very complicated to explain, and I'm not sure I have it sorted out of my head, but it's the subject of a long 40-page entry in the second edition of the UFO Encyclopedia, written by Brad Sparks, who's a California-based aeronautical engineer with a long-time interest in UFOs. And the RV-47 case is an incredible case involving a tracking of a UFO over several states via different radar sets, um, ground-based radar, radar on the RV-47 itself, and a case that lasted over a period of, you know, this off the top of my head, like a couple of hours. And it's a case that that the Condon Committee investigated, James McDonald investigated, and Brad Sparks investigated. And it's been meticulously reconstructed. And it's not only a case that is impossible to explain conventionally, but it is clear and unambiguous evidence of the presence of an unearth a sophisticated other than earthly technology. That it's an interaction between Earth American military technology and somebody else's technology that does not exist on this earth. So in other words, it's evidence not only of the it's compelling evidence of the existence of UFOs, but it's also strongly suggested in the presence of an extraterrestrial technology. So it documents not only the reality of UFOs as technological vehicles, but it also establishes that they're not from here. And it, it, it really undercuts, you know, people who want to explain everything, and explain as the apropos verb here, as paranormal or supernatural. I mean, this is a case of what looks very much like a sophisticated technological vehicle from another world. And it's an extraordinary case, and it is, it is the best case. It's not the strangest case, it's not the wildest case, but it is really a compelling case, and it's one that debunkers stay as far away from as they can. Phil Class, to his credit, did try to explain it. But his explanation didn't work for reasons that Sparks explains in his in his paper published in my encyclopedia. But yeah, that's that's the great case. And there probably would be others out there if the resources and the trained investigators were turned on them. But that one, the R B forty seven case, we do have. Now well, that's one I've got to refamiliarize myself with. Uh that does sound very compelling and Boy, I bet you it really uh, put some starch in the shorts of uh, the uh, Army Air Force at the time, and <laughs> probably made made uh, quite a few uh, military people sit up and take notice. I would I would imagine. Yeah, the initial investigation was by Blue Book, which conducted a rather cursory investigation, and I don't even remember what kind of explanation they pulled out of their nether quarters. But um, the Condon Committee came back at it. And the Condon Committee had a very good investigator on it, Gordon David Thayer. And then uh, McDonald investigated it and talked with all the, the military personnel. And then finally Sparks did the you know, the final investigation. But very well, well investigated. But you, speaking of the Condon Report, that dovetails nicely into our next set of questions. This one comes from Sentry, who is a fairly recent uh, uh, forum poster signed up in March of this year. And he asked, uh, his first question is, the Condon Report claimed, quote, nothing has come from the study of UFOs in the past 21 years that has added to scientific knowledge, close quotes. 
If you disagree with that, can you cite any examples of advances, scientific or otherwise, related to UFO research? Well, that's a good question. And um, the Condon Committee, of course, notoriously, the that particular claim, which is often quoted, is undercut by material within the Condon Committee report itself, where you know close to a third of the sightings are unexplained, and even some of the explanations for the explained ones have been challenged. Now, the scientific advancement of the UFO research is made. It gets back to something I said earlier. We know we don't know what these things are. You know, we can speculate reasonably or unreasonably about what they might be, but we don't know that. So in that sense, no, we, we haven't advanced. But we have advanced to the extent that we pretty much have a pretty good idea how they behave, what they do and what they don't do. And we see, for example, you know, the, you know, the, you know, the consistent failure to land on the White House lawn, uh, their persistent kind of way of staying in the background of things. The way we see, for example, that close encounters are more likely to occur in rural locations in late at night or in the early morning hours. Things like this, we detect these kinds of patterns associated with it. And, um, you know, with, even with close encounters with occupants, you know, we see that overwhelmingly the occupants are human or humanoid looking. You know, we're don't, not getting reports of elephants or, or, you know, giant squids coming out of UFOs or anything like that. We're seeing this consistent pattern. And these things, these patterns survive over time and space. So simply by you know, collecting data, trying to investigate what reports we can, you know, we get sort of what Mallet once called the an anatomy of a phenomenon. We see what it looks like, how it behaves, what it does, what it doesn't do. And so in that sense, we have a better grip on it than we did in 1947. And over time, you know, our, our understanding of how it acts is something that we've learned. So it hasn't been entirely futile. We're still dealing with a phenomenon that is beyond uh, human current knowledge and is difficult to document in the way that we document, you know, other things that we're more familiar with. But we do see what it's like anyway. We have learned that much, and that's the first step. Well, that's good. In 50-plus years, at least we can hang our hats on that. And, and I do agree that there are patterns to be gleaned from a lot of these uh, uh, the d databases that are out there. I, I know I felt that I was able to identify a few in my own database. So I think it's that uh, the, in, the analysis of these events in their totality and how they dovetail one to the other, uh, I think there is some something to be gained from that. Well, a second really crucial point needs to be made, and that is that science has devoted practically no attention, no resources, no funding to the investigation of this phenomenon. It's possible that if real science were done on the UFO question, we have a lot more answers than we have now. It may be that this thing isn't as unexplainable or as inexplicable as it appears to be. It's just that science hasn't done science with. And if science were done, we'd learn a lot more, probably a lot more quickly than oh, we've learned over yeah, the Yeah, good past. point. A point well taken. Well, here's Century's third question, and this is a good one uh, as well. Eyewitness testimony is imperfect and subject to distortion by post-event influences. In UFO cases, what effect does the bias of the initial interviewer have on how the event is remembered and subsequently reported? I don't think that's probably the major problem with UFO reporting. You know, first of all, the number of cases that investigators get their hand on is pretty small. And uh, I have examined UFO testimony in just about every form that it can be delivered. For example, through somebody telling me something that he saw or experienced or reading letters in archives, letters sent to magazines, UFO groups, authors, people telling their UFO experiences, unfiltered, just sitting down
down writing a letter and say, this is what I saw. And then I've seen cases where, you know, ufologists went out in the field and interviewed somebody and, and tried to figure out what the person saw. And basically, you look at all this, and it's the same thing. We have Jerry Clark with Gene and Chris. You're in Terracast. <laughs> The GCN Radio Network, providing the world with hard-hitting talk radio. G-C-N. Great talk radio starts here. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. If you'd like to listen to GCN programs on the go, I have great news. GCN has created a droid and iPhone application, and it's free. Just as easy as going to GCNlive.com, click on the banner, and download. Before you know it, you'll be listening to your favorite hard-hitting GCN shows, live or on demand, right on your droid or iPhone, 24-7 and on the go. So download the droid and iPhone app free by clicking on the banner at GCNlive.com. Thanks again for listening to GCNlive.com. Again, that's GCNlive.com. We the people grow cotton, weave fabric, engrave ink, embed strips and fibers to protect from counterfeit and carding to a private bank, having it lent back at interest, forcing taxes to service debt. This capitalism, or was Jefferson correct when stating a central bank issuing the public currency is a greater menace to the liberties of the people than a standing army? Ted Anderson, I'm placing a free silver dollar in a book that explains our monetary system. Call for your copy, 800-686-2237. It's time to understand the system. Call 800-686-2237. That's 800-686-2237. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. We return with Jerry Clark, final hour of our visit with him. He's a noted UFO historian who's been there from the early days, covering the field with a tremendous overview with Gene and Chris. Now, you were embarked on an answer during our last segment. Do you want to pick up further on it? Well, I think that basically, yes, incompetent interviewers, leading questions, all those things are not good, and you should not engage in them. You should make an effort not to do that when you talk with somebody who's had a UFO setting. But basically... The quantity of testimony about UFO sightings by now is so massive and delivered in all kinds of forms, many of them completely unfiltered by a naive investigator's leading questions, that in the end, it doesn't matter. There's a phenomenon that no matter how people report it, ends up pretty much the same. And also, witnesses aren't necessarily leadable. You know, witnesses are often very confident of what they've seen and are not interested in your idea about what they should have seen. And uh, I remember, for example, seeing correspondence between Donald Menzel and the astronomer Seymour Hess, who had a UFO sighting in about 1950. And Menzel was trying very hard to get Dr. Hess to say what Menzel thought he had seen. And Hess would not back down. Menzel's letters were full of leading questions. He was trying to get Hess to say that he had seen something that Menzel could explain. And Hess was fierce about what he had seen and went back down in Iota. Now, non, most UFO witnesses are not astronomers, but many of them are very strongly opinionated about what they saw, and they're not leading. In fact, I would be suspicious of a witness who was so weak-willed that I could shape his testimony just by the questions that I asked. Yeah, but yeah, it, it's point. just, I mean, it's an occasional problem, but it's a very minor I, I've never encountered it myself in the field. Uh, like you say, I mean, normally these events are are very memorable, and and they do tend to st- uh, stick in people's minds. You'll, you'll get some sort of personal bias, I think, and some confusion about duration, um, sequence of events and that sort of thing, but the general, you know, especially in multiple uh, witness sightings, um, you do see a, a thread of, uh, you, you know, the, the, the general details of the experience, general descriptions um, tend to all be very, very similar, if not exact. It's just the details of, of sequence of events and sometimes time duration that, that tends to get skewed, I think. Right. But I, I, I do agree with you on that. Here's, a, here's a, a couple of interesting questions from a, a fairly long-time poster on the forum, Blowfish, um, who's been posting on the forum since January uh, 2010. 
And uh, his first question is, have you read Mrs. Uh, Georgina Bruni's book, You Can't Tell the People? I, I have no, personally I, myself. No, I haven't. I, I've okay. heard of it. And have you ever experienced any, as he puts it, strange awareness slash UFO sightings yourself? No, I've never had a UFO sighting. I've had, you know, strange experiences as everybody does. And uh, the most the most dramatic of them, which I think I probably described on the show before, was this was uh, summer 11 years ago, seeing uh, on three occasions uh, what I call a phantom quadruped in my front yard. The last time I saw it, I was with my wife. And, um, you know, but I've never seen a UFO. And nor, unfortunately, do I expect to. I don't even think about it anymore. <laughs> People ask me, well, how come you've seen so many? I said, because I look. <laughs> I make a point of looking. <laughs> and oftentimes, if you live in an area where tends to be more UFO sightings than perhaps your average area, of, uh, that, that would be the rule of thumb, is just constantly keep your eyes open and, and right. keep scanning the sky. Here's another question that I... You did address this, I think, on a, on a previous appearance, but what are your thoughts on the Rendlesham Forest UFO incident? And um, I would add also that the uh, the Peniston information about the binary code and, and these new revelations that are coming out, do you, do you feel that the case still has the, uh, you know, the earmarks of being a classic UFO case, or do you think these new revelations are starting to degrade that somewhat? What What is well, your opinion of the Rendlesham case? I think, I think it's just a muddle. You know, I don't know what to think. You know, it, it just seems to be that there are so many different variations of what the story is that um, I, I just don't know. I don't really have an opinion about it. It's just confusing to me. Fortunately, I don't have to have an opinion about it. I just think, <laughs> I, I, I don't understand this. What, what's this about? It's, it's, it, it's clearly because it's a model. It can't be used as a great UFO case, even if it, maybe it is underneath all that model. But unless you know, we sort out whatever is lies underneath that model. It's just hopeless. Well, here's probably one of the toughest uh, questions you've probably ever been asked on a show like the oh, Paracast. Oh. <laughs> okay, let's get ready for this. This is going to be the zinger that Chris and I have been preparing for for lo these many years. Oh. Well, I don't know. It's for, for someone like Jerome Clark to answer, you know, the question what what is what are your top ten UFO cases? I would think that that would be that would be really difficult to to distill down, but perhaps you do have a top ten list, and perhaps no, you've been asked before. No, I, I don't have a top ten list, but I but I do have a top one list, and that's our B forty seven case. Uh -huh. So Roswell isn't up there in your? <laughs> no, no, definitely not Roswell. I mean, I I think that Roswell is in many ways you know a mystery, but I don't think it's a good UFO case. I mean, there's just too many problems with it. It doesn't mean that. Maybe something really interesting did happen, and maybe it was really at UFOs. It's just that there are so many problems with it that that it's just it's not a good UFO case. It's an interesting story. It's still a mystery, and it may be related. It may, in the end, turn out to be that the UFO did crash, but that hasn't been proved, and we just don't know. And when you talk about UFOs, you really shouldn't talk about Roswell. At least you're trying to persuade somebody on evidence, because the evidence in Roswell is so mixed and complicated and ambiguous. Do you think so, possibly here, before we go on to the next question, do you think, Jerry, possibly that Roswell has been a red herring all along? Maybe it was a secret aircraft or something, or it was a balloon, and that the memories 20, 30, 40 years later just completely clouded the entire affair? That, I don't think that's impossible. I don't think it's necessarily true, but we just don't know. I think that you know, um, we're not going to know until we get our hands on actual documents of unquestioned provenance. The right. answers are somewhere on paper in some government bureau. That's where the answers are. It's not unsolvable, but until we get those papers, we're not going to know. And, and, and as you say, there's problems with the testimony. And, um, you know, not certain problems. We don't know that, that people's memories are muddled. We don't know that, but it's certainly possible. And until we find those papers, we're not going to know. Well, that so, almost gets back to the original question about what does the government know? When did they know it? 
So you assume the government has a lot more information or somewhat more information about UFOs that they have yet to disclose? Well, they certainly have papers on the Roswell incident. Whatever the Roswell incident's about, the answers are there. They're on paper somewhere. They're just not accessible to us. Now, I don't know what the U.S. government knows or doesn't know about UFOs. I, don't, I have no idea. I do know that the U.S. government has acted, and everything that it has done in terms of you know, strategic policy since 1947 is consistent with the hypothesis that the Air Force is not covering up a huge secret that would change history. The Air Force and the U.S. government have acted since 1947 as if UFOs don't exist. And there is nothing discernible in any of the history of the Cold War and beyond that suggests otherwise. Now, that doesn't mean there couldn't be some really interesting cases and secrets that are buried somewhere, but they're certainly not affecting policy. And it's hard to believe that if they knew for sure that extraterrestrials are coming to Earth, that this would not affect policy on all kinds of levels that would be visible to the rest of us, even if we didn't know why the policies particular policies were being pursued. Well, certainly if we had evidence of extraterrestrial technology, we'd see evidence of that in our exactly. developments, and we haven't seen that despite some of the allegations otherwise. We have Jerry Clark. You're listening to Gene and Chris on Paracast. So here's what happened. I was placing an order online. The site went down. It just stopped responding. It took hours before it returned, but I had already placed the order with another company. If your site goes down, you could lose business. And if you have a business or personal site, you want to know it's easy to run and it will stay online. At iWeb, your site is hosted on one of the most reliable networks in the world. Check it out. iWeb.com. That's iWeb.com. Neighbors, do you need to bring the final touches to your latest podcasts? Clean up the soundtrack of that holiday video. Mix together a few takes from your last jamming session. Process the audio files of the video game you're creating to sound just right. But look no further. Whatever audio-related task you're looking to perform, Amadeus Pro is the tool for you. It's the Swiss Army knife of sound editing. Go to hairersoft.com. H-A-I-R-E-R soft.com. Hey everybody, Jason Lewis here once again. These are hard times for investors. If you're like me, you just don't know where to put your money because there's a downside to every possible scenario. Now look, every portfolio needs a hedge for inflation. Gold has been the classic. I want to tell you, I want to be honest with you, commodities fluctuate. So you could lose money. Gold goes up and down. But every stable portfolio usually has an inflation hedge and gold is, well, the gold standard. Washington is not going to get us out of this recovery so you've got to protect yourself. Give it some thought, and if you're interested in converting your IRA to gold or would like to actually have it in your possession, call Midas Resources today at 1-800-686-2237. The U.S. dollar was once backed by gold, but it's lost a lot of its value since then. Call Midas Resources today, 1-800-686-2237 for gold. That's 1-800-686-2237, and tell them Jason Lewis sent you. Before you throw away your used batteries, you need to listen to this. Now, going green can save money. Go green and save money by giving life to your used batteries by charging them with the Renaissance Charger. The Renaissance Charger uses a new revolutionary battery charging technology that effectively extends the life of new batteries and gives new life to used batteries. Invented by legendary audio genius John Bedini, this unique and patented charging system rejuvenates the electrochemical plate structure in the battery without additives, increasing capacity and maintaining cell integrity. Renaissance Charge offers a full line of products made in the USA for all types and sizes of batteries. Find out why our customers tell us the Renaissance Charger is the only battery charger they will ever use. Save your money. Save the environment. Visit us online at r-charge.com. That's r-charge.com. Or call us at 208-772-4514. That's 208-772-4514. Be a part of the revolution today. 
If you constantly feel run down and tired, your pH level might be low and your body could be full of toxins. If what you drink is not at a pH level of 8 or higher, you are inviting bacteria and acid to thrive in your body. But there is something you can do. Simply add 10 drops of AlkaVision Plasma pH drops to your water to help your body rid itself of acidic waste, increase oxygen, and raise your pH balance to optimum levels. AlkaVision Plasma pH drops combine a unique formula of the most alkaline minerals in the world. Alkalizing the water you you drink, ridding your body of acidic waste and toxins, and helping you regain energy and vibrant health. And studies show viruses, bacteria, and toxins cannot survive in an alkaline, high pH environment. Order your bottle of AlkaVision Plasma pH drops at AlkaVision.com. That's A L K A Vision.com. Or call 269 409 1776. 269 409 1776. Alkalize your body. Supercharge your health at AlkaVision.com today. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And if you'd like to catch up on past episodes, we have hundreds of shows for you to download direct from theparacast.com. That's theparacast.com. Or check us out at iTunes. On the Paracast with Gene and Chris, we are asking your questions of Jerome Clark. We don't guarantee his responses. But let me just amplify on that, of course. If we had actually recovered a UFO, and that takes us back to Roswell, don't you think one of the biggest indictments against that is the fact that we've seen not even a snippet of evidence of technology that maybe he came from something that we couldn't invent ourselves? Steve Jobs was not E.T. I agree with you completely. I've said the same thing myself. So the whole Corso uh, scenario with salting uh, private industry with uh, uh, exotic uh, alien-derived technology doesn't hold much water in in your view. Well, that book is is a hoax. But I want to also add that I have a lot of respect for uh, investigators like Kevin Randall and Don Schmidt and Tom Carey, these guys have really done a good job. And I read their stuff, and they have found stuff that is very difficult to explain, that is indeed intriguing. So the question is open, but I don't think that we've established anything. It's just that there is a historical mystery that begins in Roswell in early July 1947. Any claims beyond that are have all kinds of problems positive claims, negative claims, we just don't know, and we're going to have to be satisfied with that until those government papers are available to us. Then we will know. So the Annie Jacobson assertion that uh, that Joseph Stalin, uh, along with the help of Joseph Mengele, trained and malformed kids to fly saucers, and one of them crashed at Roswell. <laughs> you know, that sounds like the plot of a trashy paperback you buy at the airport. <laughs> Or at the very least, buys up a pretty boring book about Area 51. I I don't know. Um, I always kind of liked Nick Redfern's uh, idea that they were Japanese prisoners of war and and body snatchers in the desert. I, I like when people get creative with a a dead horse like Roswell and uh, start looking at it from new and different angles. At least it you know gives you something new to think about, you know, or, or at least laugh at. Um, well, he just you know he he had like everybody else some anonymous you know, unknown reliability or unknown motivation. It was just, you know, those things are really better dealt with in novels than in allegedly nonfiction books. Right. Well, we had John Alexander and Stanton Friedman debating UFO secrecy on the Paracast here a couple of weeks back, and I must say it it was quite a civil um, and and very cordial conversation, and um, I think the two men found they had more their thinking was they had more in common than they would have probably thought going in. But the whole idea of UFO secrecy now, uh, you know, we're, we're dealing with something. I think you described the apparent government uh, position on on the UFO question. Uh, and, but then you hinted around that there probably is quite a uh, substantial body of evidence. Of course, there's gun camera footage. There's, you know, the, the Gordon Cooper alleged footage. There's some pretty compelling evidence that they do have some sort of 
of information that they're not releasing, but how do you think that that is organized? Or do you think it's a multi-departmental thing? Do you think there's a UFO desk somewhere? Do you think this has all been farmed out to, to the military industrial complex, uh, as Eisenhower put it? Do you think the military has uh, co-opted uh, all this information? I mean, what is your sense as a longtime researcher in this field about the whole question of UFO secrecy? Of course, you know, John Alexander claims that they don't, there is no uh, holder of the secrets uh, in government. Well, what is your opinion? Well, I have a lot of respect for what John Alexander has to say. John's an interesting guy. He has a lot of interesting experience, personal and professional experience to draw from. So I l listen very carefully to what John Alexander yeah, so said. I suspect that there's probably some small off-the-books group with guys with a very high security clearances who monitor the situation. And the, the secrets are kept within that tiny little off-the-books group, They're kind of like a working group. And that when work has to be done on one particular question or other, it's farmed out, not as necessarily as, here, we want you to look at this item of UFO evidence or this interesting UFO sighting or this film or whatever, but I think they're very careful about how this material is dealt with. But it's not like a huge, massive cover-up. It's just a few guys, a small group, probably with some assistance from, you know, professionals in the particular areas of expertise, making sure that this doesn't get to be a national security problem. The issue here being, Jerry, that the government doesn't really pay attention or consider whether it's ET, it's whether we face a security issue. And if that's not the case, we don't worry about it. We have to worry about it to the extent that it could be a potential national security issue. But if it isn't, and it certainly doesn't seem to have been since 1947, after all, they haven't invaded and taken us over, you know, they can continue to live with it. Unless, of course, they invaded the Fed. They invaded the Fed, and Ben Bernanke is really one of them. Yeah, I remember the Weekly World News years ago had a, a big story about which U.S. centers were actually aliens and uh, yeah, there's all kinds of jokes about that. But, but I can actually, think I of think a few who strike me as being alien and for different reasons. <laughs> yeah, but I, I don't you know, I don't believe in MJ-12 or any of that sort of stuff. I think that's all nonsense. But I do think there probably is some small working group that monitors. What bothers me is why does someone like Stanton Friedman, who has done such great work in the UFO field, why is he still wrapped up in MJ-12? Well, he has to be. Well, I don't, you know, I, I, I've known Stan for a long time, and I don't want to read his mind, but I, I think that, you know, he's, this is the wrong tree that he's chosen to bark up, and apparently he's going to keep barking, so it's his life, his career, but uh, I don't buy it. Yeah, once you've taken the plunge, it's kind of hard to uh, get out of the pool and dry off without anybody noticing. You think that's a lot of it there, that just Stan is not going to up and admit, you know, guys, I made a mistake here. He's going to stick to it till the end of his days. Well, I think Stan's a lot like Phil Class. I think that they have much the same kind of personality. They were just on opposite sides of the question. But I think Stan is a stubborn guy who believes very strongly that he's right and is not the son of the guy who he's going to back down. And uh, I just don't see the evidence for MJ-12. And he was kind enough to send me both editions of his book on MJ-12. And I, in each case, I sat down and I said, I'm going to read this with a completely open mind. And I'm going to try to see if Stan can convince me. And I'll just keep my, my mind blank and just follow the evidence. I still wasn't convinced, not even remotely. Wow. And I don't think many people in this field believe in MJ-12. Okay. Stan is really the, the holdout. But as I say, it's, you know, it's his life. Well, you know, it's funny. We look at the person who got this film of the MJ-12 documents, Jamie Chandere, and right. you look him up at the, he's supposedly a, what, a video producer or something? Mm -hmm. And I don't know what his credentials are because if you look in professional credentials like the Internet Movie Database, he's not there, except maybe as a video editor in one film in the 70s if it's the same guy. Why would he attract this kind of of information. We have Jerome Clark joining us with Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast.
America's number one source for independent talk radio for over a decade. We are the GCN Radio Network. Graphic Converter is the image manipulation tool for the rest of us. It does not use any database. You get full control of all your files. Want to view the images of a folder? Drag it into Graphic Converter, and a powerful browser opens up to show your image files. You could use it for slideshows. You could use it to import images from digital cameras or from scanners. Need to do some image editing? You can do that, too, in Graphic Converter. Also, print catalogs. Convert from so many formats, I can't even list them. Download now to see see if Graphic Converter is good for you, like one and a half million other users. Guess what? You could save money when you buy Graphic Converter. Use the coupon code NIGHTOWL. Use the coupon code NIGHTOWL to get a special price for Graphic Converter. Go to LemkeSoft.com. That's L-E-M-K-E Soft.com. LemkeSoft.com. L-E-M-K-E Soft.com. Iodine protection packs from HempUSA.org are now in stock for immediate delivery worldwide. Our iodine protection packs include micro plant powder, green life kelp, red palm oil, and our clear roll-on iodine that will feed the body the iodine it needs. All iodine protection packs are in stock, save you money, and ship for free in all 50 states. Visit HempUSA.org or call 908-691-2608 today. HempUSA.org has a revolutionary wonder food for detoxing the body and rebuilding the immune system. Micro plant powder can help unclog arteries and soften heart valves while removing heavy metals, virus, fungus, bacteria, and parasites. Plus, it cleans and purifies the blood, lungs, stomach, and colon. Keep your body clean with micro plant powder. Visit us at HempUSA.org or call 908-691-2608 today. Big Berkey water filters are in high demand. Storable foods are also in high demand. BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com has always kept our focus on the Berkey water filter products. But increasingly, our customers have been asking for storable foods. After months of research, BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com now offers great-tasting, long-lasting, storable foods. These ready-to-eat meals are packed in airtight nitrogen pouches. All you do is just add water. And because they're sealed so well, they come with a 25-year shelf life. Combine Combine our Berkey water filters, which are powerful enough to purify treated, untreated, or even stagnant pond water with our storable foods, and you have a winning combination. Remember, we offer free shipping on every order over $50, and GCN listeners receive 5% off all ceramic filter systems. Visit Big B-E-R-K-E-Y waterfilters.com or call 877-99-BERKEY. That's Big Berkey waterfilters.com or call 877-99-BERKEY today. With economic news getting worse each day, are you ready for the hard times ahead? This is Bill Hyde with a special self-reliance report. Studies show that in a true crisis, 8 out of 10 people will remain sheep-like and passive, frozen like deer in the headlights of an oncoming car, waiting for others to help. One out of ten will actually panic and endanger family and friends as they melt down under pressure. And only one out of ten will take swift and decisive action when the going gets tough, dramatically increasing their chances of survival. That's why I'm excited to announce we've published a new book called Ready for Anything. It's a must-read for anyone who wants to increase their chances of survival in the coming hard times ahead. To read more about this important new book, go to readyforanything.com. That's readyforanything.com. Take swift and decisive action by getting your copy today at readyforanything.com. That's readyforanything.com. Hi, this is nuclear physicist lecturer Stanton Friedman. You are listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. We're back with Jerome Clark with Gene and Chris and the Paracast. Jared, before we go on with any more questions, do you have any comments about that? I've wondered the same thing myself, you know, actually, that you raise a very interesting question. And I don't, you know, the whole genesis of the MJ-12 documents and so on is just odd. I mean, I don't want to make up a big sinister conspiracy out of it, but there certainly are some unanswered questions. And one of them is, you know, what is Jamie Shand Ray's role in all of this? I, you're absolutely right to raise that question. Yeah, the issue is here is he seems to be an invisible entity. I mean, you would say to somebody who 
basically shoots wedding videos? What does he do? If he worked for the motion picture or television industries, the Internet Movie Database, IMDB, they even got an iPhone app and probably an Android app. You can look up things about the crew of movies and TV shows, learn about their life histories and everything else. So that's the question here. You know, why would you pick him? I might as well have gotten a copy. I had more presence in the UFO field than he did. I don't really understand what was going on. I also don't understand a lot of things about Bill Moore's behavior. I think the whole thing just seems odd and murky, but I think in the end what matters is that wherever they came from, wherever they were generated, the MJ-12 documents are bogus. That's one thing we can be certain of, I think. There was no MJ-12. Well, I would think that back in the late 40s, early 50s, before the military and the government had determined the national security implications of the phenomenon, I'm pretty sure that they did have some sort of MJ-12-like group, but um, I don't think it, it probably lasted long, and Blue Book and Grudge and Sign probably dovetailed um, out of some sort of initial effort by this group. But uh, personally, I, I've always felt that uh, you know the MJ-12 scenario was downwind of the fish market myself. But uh, Well, I always I mean, thought that when whoever wrote it put Donald Menzel in as a member of MJ-12, this was like like a joke, that this, this was t- like a wink to the reader. Right. And yeah, that's what it, I mean. the, Yeah, it was like, this tells you it's a joke. But Stan Friedman ran with it. And now he, you know, he's been convinced for some time that that Menzel, of course, who was the most influential debunker in the history of the UFO controversy, was actually a, you know, a protector of the secrets of, you know, crash disks and extraterrestrial visitation. It just seems uh, unlikely to me. Yeah. Well, how come Stan was was hired and paid a substantial sum of money to do the actual analysis and document research? I mean, he's not. He, he's a nuclear scientist uh, by training. Why? Who was it I that hired him? Was hardly a that? disinterested observer. Well, I wouldn't say that, but uh, you would think that you could you could find a professional uh, document. Uh, uh, I don't know what they call them, the uh, people that authenticate documents, but you'd think that uh, there there were other people uh, eminently more qualified to do the examination of the documents uh, than Stan Friedman. Yeah, I don't think Stan at all was qualified. Cool. Period. I mean, he just shouldn't have done it, and he shouldn't have put himself in there. He, he should have. He should have just stayed out of it, and 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 maybe you know recommended somebody or something. But it, it's just the whole thing is just kind of an enormous waste of time in the end. Well, what, what about Bob and Ryan Wood and, and the way that they've taken that MJ12 ball and just. <laughs> You know, like a like a big hefty fullback, they've been bowling that ball down the field for almost ten years now, and they are absolutely convinced that the MJ12 document plus the other documents that have come out are all legitimate, and they are, you know, they all should be uh, considered as as smoking gun evidence of uh, conspiracy and cover up and the rest of it. Uh, what do you think of Bob and Ryan's work in this? Well, I uh, actually saw Bob Wood and Ryan Wood lecture on their material at a convention of the Society for Scientific Exploration in 2008, and uh, they were really excited at the time because they had just gotten a document that linked MJ-12 with the Kennedy assassination. Now, to me, anytime you're linking, (laughs) you've got some extremely outlandish claim, and then you link it with everybody's favorite pseudo-mystery, the Kennedy assassination. You just completely <laughs> lost me. Not that I was on board to start with, but I just thought, oh, boy. Well, of course, we have the Maury Island case, which was a possible hoax, and we link that with the Kennedy assassination because one of those harbor patrolmen, Fred Lee Chrisman, was a possible figure in the Kennedy assassination investigation. Well, he wasn't. I mean, they, they know that he wasn't anywhere near Dallas. They know who the... He was supposed to be one of these three hobos, and all the hobos have been identified, and everybody knows who they were and what their life stories were and how they ended up there. And Chrisman, you know, was, was in the Pacific Northwest on November 22nd, 1963. So that 
that's just another one of these idiot red herrings. And um, it's just, I don't know, I, I don't really have a lot of patience with this stuff, except maybe a certain kind of clinical interest. <laughs> oh, my favorite is Marilyn Monroe was actually murdered because uh, she knew about Roswell. That's that's another oh, one yeah. that I've always... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I want to say that I like Bob. I don't know Ryan Wood, but I do know Bob Wood. And, and he, you know, Bob Wood has always been nice to me, and um, I have nothing to say against Bob Wood. It's just that I don't agree with them about this. Right. Well, that's it for our, our listener questions. Uh, I'm not sure if um, if Gene has any more. I know I do. Well, I, I have I, lots of questions several, always, several but shows, I'm going to let uh, you, because I'll, you've I'll been be enjoying good. yourself so much walking around your room there asking other people's questions why don't you ask some of your own <laughs> well one of the things that i've been harping on over the past couple of years is you know the the very rapidly aging of the ufo uh, buff uh, crowd just the you know the rank and file people out there interested in the subject you go to your your average ufo conference and the the average age is up there in the upper 60s, early 70s now. What are the things that we need to come up with to get young people interested to the extent of really devoting quality time and getting involved in field investigation, getting involved in doing quality research like you've done in your life? What's, what is it going to take for us to ensure that we have a new generation of interested researchers and investigators coming up and uh, moving that ball down the field after we're gone. Well, I think the whole model of ufology is changing, just as the whole model of a whole lot of things is changing because of the Internet. Right. And the, the model of the old UFO organization, which publishes a, you know, a bulletin or a magazine or a journal, I think you know, is probably going away of a lot of other things that were central to our lives, but we're now going to be viewing on screens and elsewhere. I find that um, I'm actually rather optimistic about the future of anomalistics. I think that um, there are some very interesting and smart younger people already making contributions and um, not necessarily focused on ufology, but on anomalistics generally and bringing intellectual discipline that I wasn't seeing when I was that young and, and their age. And, um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm reasonably optimistic. You know, these questions will remain, and there will always be a certain number of people interested in them. And it will just, you know, sustain itself. There's not much that you or I can do about it. I mean, if it, I, try to win, I try to make a point when I get a letter or an email from a young reader to be sure that I answer the question, and um, and try to be helpful and try to sustain the interest and um, you know you, you, there's nothing we can do it's just you know you could, you could just on a person to person level pay attention to young people answer their questions now you know, even if their questions are naive that they're starting out like everybody all of us started out right we were teenagers once a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Jerry Clark yeah. joins us with Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. Are you tired of searching for great talk radio? Something more important. Search no more. We are the GCN Radio Network. You expect professional service from your doctor, your accountant, and even the girl who takes your morning coffee order. Why not from your domain registrar, too? Namecheap.com provides stellar service with no sneaky upselling. We offer more features and security options for your website than there are ways to order a latte. And new domains come with WhoisGuard to protect your personal info. At Namecheap.com, you can get your domain for as low as $2.99. Now is a great time to get to know Namecheap.com. 
For 58 years, fate has provided true reports of the strange and unknown. Fate brings you the latest in all aspects of the paranormal, like angels and miracles, psychic phenomena, ghosts, UFOs, and much, much more. To receive your complimentary Fate magazine, call now at 1-800-728-2730 or visit their website at www.fatemag.com. That's 1-800-728-2730. What are you waiting for? Your fate awaits. Jason Lewis here. We talk daily about all the crazy stuff happening around the world. Concerns with the economy, job loss, and natural disasters, just to name a few. Let me ask you, what are you doing to be prepared? How will you provide for your family in an emergency? Well, for my preparation, I recommend WiseFoodStorage.com. WiseFoodStorage.com offers delicious, ready-made, freeze-dry meals that carry a 25-year shelf life, and you prepare them in minutes by simply adding water. Wise Food Storage entrees are packaged in individual metal mylar pouches, then stored in convenient grab-and-go plastic containers for freshness and easy transport. Go to wisefoodstorage.com today to request a free entree sample. And for a limited time, enter the promo code LEWIS to get free shipping on any order. Call 855-FOODWISE. That's 855-366-3947 or visit wisefoodstorage.com. Wisefoodstorage.com, gourmet emergency food at the best price. If you owe money to the IRS, you can't make the problem go away by yourself. But with the help of Dan Pilla, you can get your problem solved once and for all. Hi, I'm Dan Pilla. For 30 years, I've helped thousands of people solve their tax debt problem, and I can help you solve yours, too. We take a very simple but proven three-step approach to solving your problem. First, we stabilize IRS collection actions so you don't have to worry about the IRS seizing your bank account or paycheck. Next, we build a comprehensive plan to get your tax debt reduced to the fullest extent possible, sometimes even completely eliminated. And finally, we work with you every step of the way to get your problem solved once and for all. Call us for a free consultation. Call 1-800-346-6829. We'll work together to get your problem solved guaranteed. Dan Pilla has been protecting taxpayers from the IRS for three decades, and he can help you too. Call us today at 800 800- Three four six six eight two nine. That's eight hundred three four no tax. I have bought a few bottles of heart and body extract and have to say that it it certainly does work. That's what Jack from Michigan had to say after his experience with heart pain and what he did to treat it with heart and body extract. I actually had a huge heart flutter. I was also having some edema around my ankles and very worrisome clot in my uh, right leg that would happen from time to time while I was trying to sleep. Heart and body extract is all natural with no negative side effects. It will help repair or correct past problems associated with the heart and body circulation. After my second bottle of heart and body extract, all problems are now gone. Order at hbextract.com or call 866-295-5305. I ordered a third bottle of Heart and Body Extract for maintenance as I want to keep everything working. Order Heart and Body Extract at 866-295-5305 or hbextract.com. Heart and Body Extract for a long and healthy life. Hello, this is Rosemary Ellen Guiley, and you're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. If you have a comment or a question, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. We're talking to Jerry Clark, UFO historian, author of the UFO Encyclopedia, with Gene and Chris on the Paracast, looking at why young people don't seem to get involved as much as they should. I know my son read one UFO book in his life by Kurt Southerly, and that was it. He hasn't pursued the subject any further, although he writes science fiction with me. And I guess that's another thing, too. The people involved in heavy-duty science fiction have often been, as they say, antagonistic towards people involved in UFO research. Have you seen that? Well, I know that, you know, I'm not a science fiction fan, but I, I, I do know that the writers are more likely to be hostile than the the rank and file. And at least that's what I learned from people I know who are involved in the science fiction world and some of them science fiction writers. They say that, that if anything, the average science fiction fan is more curious about the subject than 
most people. But you know, I you know, it, 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 it doesn't really matter. Either you're interested in this or you're not. My own children, I have three children. They're all grown. Have no interest whatsoever in this. They're not hostile to it. They just aren't interested, and I've never done anything to encourage their interest or, or discourage it. That's their decision. And as I say, it's appealing to some people, and it's not appealing to apparently most people, at least on, on the level that it appeals to us who are really immersed our lives in it. But, you know, it'll work itself out. These, these mysteries will remain. And strange things will happen. Strange things will be seen. And the people who want to get answers, who are curious, will act accordingly. Well, that's the good question here with the old guard slowly leaving, is UFO research ultimately going to die out except for a few diehards? No. no. It'll, it'll, it, it will continue. It'll continue in a different form because technology, the information transformation technology is changing radically. And uh, it will change that way. For example, the, my major project in the, in the new century has been working with a small group of international researchers uh, um, using the Internet to uh, collect material on anomalies from old newspapers. I, you know, for a fee, you can get access to thousands of old newspapers, and you have search words, and I have an immense amount of material that I have accumulated in this decade of old newspaper clippings about a wide range of Fordian phenomena, proto-UFO sightings, mystery airships, and all those things, cryptozoological phenomena, Called from 19th and early 20th century newspapers. So I've just been, you know, enormously excited. And there are other researchers in this little group that I belong to, people from all over the world, from Europe and uh, Russia, places like that, uh, who are doing the same thing and we're exchanging information and really getting a sense of, you know, the history of anomalies, how anomalies change, how society receives them. What people report, what they experience, what the what the hoaxes are. It's just you know, it, and it really gives you a perspective on, on on the more modern era that we know from our own you know personal involvement. And so to me, it's it, it remains fascinating. And most of the people in this group are a lot younger than I am. Well, Jacques Vallée is probably the oldest member. Right. But um, it's it, it's you know, I think there's a, there's a definitely a future. And it'll be interesting. I just wish I were going to be around to see it. Yeah. Well, Chris Aubeck has struck me as somebody that's a real up-and-comer, as a really good uh, researcher, a very good digger. And, uh, you know, if he's indicative of the new wave of, of younger researchers that are that are up-and-coming, then, then I, I agree with you. That there is hope. But kids, kids nowadays just seem in general to be pretty jaded and cynical about pretty much everything. And, well, uh, I think I, it's it's it, it's hard to make broad statements. Like people have always said that about young people. I mean, yeah, you know, <laughs> people thousands of years ago said the same thing. I mean, it, people are different, and there are some people who whose brains are in gear and who really want to know stuff. And I think that describes the three of us. Right. And there's there are, you know we're always going to be a minority, but there will always be people who who want to know, who have curiosity who love knowledge, who love grappling with complicated, difficult questions. There always will be people. Chris, you mentioned Chris Aubeck. Chris Aubeck is a great guy. Uh, Teo Payments from from Holland is a fantastic Fordian mm-hmm. researcher. There are some really good people out there. Of course, John Greenwald has always been, um, I think, a real inspiration yes. to me and, and to others uh, with the amount of work that he's done putting together the Black Vault. I mean, that is... Talk about a resource. I mean, that is a huge, huge undertaking that he's done. Plus, he's got a radio show. Plus, he you know, publishes. Plus, he's got all these wonderful projects. He's, you're, you're seeing him out and about on, on, this, on the UFO speaking circuit. Um, I think he's very grounded. I think he's a little possibly uh, <laughs> overwhelmed and, and, and naive, uh, if I can say that uh, in a kind and gentle way. I, I really like him. One thing that I've noticed, though, uh, Jerry, the last couple of years, we've seen what kind of appears to be a, a bit of a resurgence in interest, I think, in the subject. It could par- partially be due to a lot of the shows that have been on. Um, the media seems to be uh, a little bit more open and accepting of the subject matter. 
I noticed last year uh, at the, well, earlier this year at the UFO Congress, uh, their inaugural uh, Scottsdale, you know, location since they moved, you know, from Laughlin, it was standing room only. Uh, they had, I think, uh, 1,200 to 1,500 people there. Um, but the MUFON this year out in, uh, in Irvine had uh, a surprisingly large turnout uh, compared to uh, the last couple of years. So perhaps we are seeing a resurgence of interest in, in these subject areas. And, and, I, and I did notice more and more young people, uh, too, that seemed to be interested and, and fairly up to speed. This is a very difficult subject to, to get up to speed on. It's, it's, you really have to be dedicated. Oh, yes. You really have to, to do your homework to, to be able to speak intelligently about this with uh, some of the longer you know, <laughs> researchers are longer in the tooth, shall we say, like the three of us. But, uh, you know, I, I do agree. I think that there is uh, just a, a part of human, the human psyche that uh, tends to get kicked off in some people in terms of just being curious. I think it all boils down to just intellectual curiosity. And uh, I think the humans, by and large, are curious uh, unless they watch too much television, and then their curiosity is... Or said them. Well, there will always be scientists and artists and, um, you know, people doing interesting things that, that aren't, they're engaged with the world outside their house or their television set or their computer. And um, they will always be a minority, but they will always drive the human adventure. And we ufologists are in that group of people. And, um, you know, we're, we're, you know, I'm interested in UFOs because I find the world interesting. Yeah. I find human beings interesting. I find everything interesting. And, um, you know, I know that makes me and us a minority, but we'll always be here. We'll, you know, or at least our equivalents will always be here. And, and the human quest will continue. Speaking of quests, Jerry Clark, you're working on a revision to one of your books. Can you tell us more? Well, I'm just close to finishing, I hope, in the next few weeks. Uh, the third edition of my 40 and Omnibus, Unexplained. And this one has an enormous amount of new material in it and is, is a significant revision from the previous two editions. And uh, my wife, who was a professional proofreader all of her editorial career, read over most of the manuscript recently and could proofread it and without any prompting from me. She said, this is pretty good. <laughs> So that was a little note of encouragement. So maybe people will like the book when it's out next year. Well, I think, of course, we'll have you back on the show to talk about it, and you will send us autographed copies, me and Chris, so that you we... will get copies. That's for sure. Okay, Excellent. we look Thank forward you. to that. So, if someone wants to get more of your information, do you have a website or something? No, I'm this. I I'm just a complete luddite. You know, I'm findable. Just look up Jerome Clark through Google, and you'll you'll find me. We found One or two references uh, will we'll turn up. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Fair enough. Chris, where do we find you? Well, I lurk uh, on the Paracast forum, of course. It's forum.theparacast.com. I do have a website that uh, I, I promise I'm going to be... I, I, I'm locked out of my own website, right? <laughs> so I need to uh, to get that process along and revamping uh, my website, but it's ourstrangeplanet.com. We'll get it fixed up. We'll get it working not to fear. Jerry Clark, thanks for joining us this week on the Paracast. Thanks for having me. The Paracast, featuring Gene Steinberg and Christopher O'Brien, is a copyrighted presentation of Making the Impossible Incorporated. Tune in next week for a new adventure in the Paracast.